This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. Hello and welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicke and as always... I'm with the company of Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. Yes, welcome to our company. <laughs> and of one, so two, good three, to be here four. in the company. Oh, you're thinking like a dance oh. company. Oh, yeah, we're, we're a troupe. I Would was, you prefer the term troupe? No, I was just thinking a tech startup. Yeah, oh, I was thinking yeah. of a a really exciting business opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> get yeah, on the is. ground floor. You do it, regret it. It's just based in dance. Ah, oh. huh. okay, that could work. I was going to give you a tour of the office, um, including the giant slide we have. But, um, <gasps> yeah, okay, we can be a dance troupe, I guess. You can dance down a slide. <laughs> Just watch me. <laughs> I've tried. Whee! I've tried. <laughs> By God, he's done it. <laughs> hey, Jess, how does this show work? That's what everyone's got. There's a question on everyone's lips. Well, Matt, what a fantastic question. The way this show works is one of the three of us fucks off and we think about a topic. We think about it, we research, we read about it, we watch stuff about it and then we write a little report, we bring it back to the other two. They don't know what we're going to talk about uh, and we talk about it for a while while they interrupt a lot Mm -hmm. and we usually Mm -hmm. get onto topic with a question. Yeah, can I ask you a question? Please. Well, here it is. Who was voted the greatest male athlete of the past 200 years by the Australian <laughs> Confederation of Sport in 1988, a year you weren't born in yet. The greatest, the greatest sportsman. Greatest sportsman, male athlete of the last 200 years. Oh, it seems like the kind of thing it would be hard to judge when you assume most people on the panel weren't alive for that whole period. Most. Most. <laughs> Not all, most. Yeah. You're a fool to deal in absolutes. It's a famous quote from the movies. But it's from an Australian, The what was the organisation? Australian Confederation of Sport. So is it an Australian sports person? Sports yes. man. We know it's a man. I'm being politically correct, but we know it's a man. This is 1988. They've got no time for your PC. <laughs> if it, In the 80s, PC meant penises and cocks. <laughs> <laughs> what was your guess, Dave? My guess is Teddy Whitten. Is that right? Oh. Am I dropping an <laughs> AFL legend there? Uh, this wasn't the Footscray Confederation of Sport, Dave. No, that is a, that is a good That's Mr. Football. Um, is a it a, uh, was it a cricketer? It was a cricketer. <gasps> was it the Don? It was the Don. Oh, my God. <laughs> Are we doing the Don? We're doing Finally? the Don. Finally. Don is getting done. His Don is good. Cricketing legend, Don Bradman. Oh, my God. This is so huge. It's big. I happen to know that no one's ever even requested this topic. Is that right? <laughs> it's just one of my pet topic choices. No, it has <laughs> been suggested multiple times by Adrian Newman, by Julian McMahon Hyde. Adrian Newman actually said something like there was an injustice being done that we hadn't got around to it. And this was about <laughs> three years ago when he suggested it. <laughs> Julian McMahon Hyde with a fantastic triple barrel. Uh, Kelly Clark, Courtney from Townsville, Sam Charles Jones, another triple, and Nathan Damon. And of course, Gaddy J from the UK. Gary J <laughs> has been petitioning for how many weeks now? Um, uh, he's into the 30s. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I, I found all of his posts in the Patreon Facebook group, gave them all a tab to themselves. And it almost blew up my computer. There was so many of them. <laughs> so I feel like we should explain that to people that don't support us on on Patreon or in the Facebook group there that every week he comes out <laughs> begging us to put him out of his misery and let us do the topic. He did not think it was going to take this long and he gives us facts, he gives us stories and I assume, Matt, you've written the entire report based on Gary J's stuff. What I did was I read all of Gary J's work I screwed it up and I put it in the bin and I started again. Yeah, that's the way true pros do it. Because Gary J is from the UK and Don Bradman would have hated some pommy git. <laughs> no, he, I think he got on very well with the English uh, Don, so I <laughs> don't know why I was trying to start trouble there. Apologies. Cheers, Gary J from the UK. Uh, big cricket fan. So, yeah, I did read a lot of what he wrote and um, uh, some of his fun facts I'll, f- I'll tell you about. At the end of the report, but this is a long one. This is, I think this is the longest report I've ever written 
word uh, by word count. I don't know how else you would man, ma- uh, measure it. <laughs> um, uh, how long is it in feet and inches? Yeah. Okay. Feel? You gotta, can you measure it in yeah. sort of vibe? You can measure it in emotion, sure. Yeah. Emotionally, it's pretty small. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Word I, count large. I've got to say, other than obviously knowing the name Don Bradman because he's a an Australian legend, I know very little about him as a person. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think I was the same. I uh, was very similar. Mm. Most of what I know about him is from the Paul Kelly song, Bradman. Of course. That's uh, where I know re- most things. It's like a 10-minute song where he does go through a lot of his life. So, <laughs> I mean, I know a lot. <laughs> uh, anyway, that, I, I was going to include that in there, but I really, I've just been writing and writing. Anyway, let me start talking and talking instead. <laughs> I'm going to transition now. Okay, so... Donald George Bradman was born in Cootamundra, New South Wales, on the 27th of August, 1908. 27th of August. Yes. Oh, yeah. Is that is that one of your birthdays? It's very close to it. Is it he's in between us. Oh, my God. Oh, is he what... turning 30 this year? <laughs> well, you've, I don't know if you heard the last bit. He was born in 1908. So is he turning 30 this year? I cannot stress how bad I am at maths. <laughs> Just answer but, the question. Yes. Thank you. Yes, he Ooh. is. Three of you sharing that big milestone together. That's pretty nice. That's yeah, cute. Uh, yeah, that's funny. So, yeah, you're one of you's on the 26th and one of you's on the 28th. And I know Dave is the little one, so he's on the 28th. Good job. Yes. And the second littlest is Don Bradman. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but he was actually the youngest in his family, the youngest of George and Emily Bradman's four kids. In 1911, the Bradmans relocated to Barrel, about 265 kilometres east, to be closer to Emily's family. According to the Bradman Trail website, at his new home at Shepherd Street Barrel, he developed a game to while away the hours where he would repeatedly tap a golf ball with a cricket stump against a curve, a curved course of bricks supporting the family water tank. Using the house wall as one boundary on his offside, he managed to construct test matches in his head where he, <laughs> as the batsman, would pit himself against the unpredictable balls delivered by the tank stand. <laughs> you know what's funny about that? That's one of the three things that I know about Don Bradman. You know, his, <laughs> his, his test average, that he was the best ever, and then the third thing is that when he was a kid he used a stump and a golf ball and hit it against a wall and for some reason that's why he's the best we've ever had. Isn't it funny? It's, it's an iconic thing about him but when... Like and I always, I never questioned it, but reading it back, it's like, oh, little Don, <laughs> playing a made-up game by himself. You feel for the boy, but I mean, oh, his three siblings, no one wants to play. Not oh. interested. Don. Yeah, what it doesn't mention is the other three are happily playing together, a normal <laughs> game. They're playing Pictionary or something, <laughs> and they're asking him to play. Don, come play with us. No. No, I'm playing a test match in my mind. That's what it takes to be the best in the future. (laughs) One day I'll beat the tank. (laughs) Don, you'll never make it. You'll never be anything, 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 anything. (laughs) Cut to him at the crease. (laughs) (laughs) It goes on to say his constant application of this game using the challenging tools that he limited limited himself to acutely developed his hand-eye coordination to a very high degree. How's your eye-mouth coordination there? (laughs) I'm not... Um, early on in this report, it's not looking good. (laughs) Bradman would later write in his book titled Farewell to Cricket, I can understand how it must have developed the coordination of brain, eye and muscle, which was to serve me well in matches later on. Buddy, too right, Don. (laughs) Well written, hey? Not only great at cricket, also great with a word. Poet. It's inspiring. Bradman started kinder in 1913. I know this is the stuff you want to hear about. When did he start kinder, though? <laughs> tell me. Tell me when did he start kinder. Was it four-year-old kinder? <laughs> <laughs> At what point were you like, you realise this is your longest report ever and you're talking about him at kinder? <laughs> I, yeah, I, this is very sh- very short. I, I, I whipped through his schooling. So he started kinder in 1913 when he was five years old. While at school he played cricket. I don't know if that, does that take you by surprise? In 1919, he played his first organised match, scoring 55 not out. There weren't many games like this for young Don to play, but he had another chance the following year to play against a team from nearby town Mittagong, 
He scored 115 out of his team's total of 156. So straight off the bat, dominating. Hmm. Uh, the Bradman Foundation writes that he never suffered from nerves when confronted with new or challenging situations. He simply met the challenges as best as he was able at the time. As he sc- never did. He was never. Never. Never came across something unknown and went, huh, what's this? He, he was like, whatever, I've got this. Fuck off. He was missing that bit of his brain. It was very sad. <laughs> it was also the bit of his brain that let him know it was embarrassing to play stickball by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know. It's, it sounds like he's got the same biographer as Kim Jong-un. Like, oh, yeah, he, he was the best ever. He got nine holes in one. He's never taken a shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, I'm mate. honestly you ne- never nervous felt about things I've done a hundred times. <laughs> you know? I just have a general feeling of anxiety and unease all the time. I have that as well. Hmm. People, I think, don't realise I do because um, I look dead on the outside. But inside, (laughs) a little bundle of nerves. I wouldn't say you look dead per se. (laughs) I'd say dying, Dying. sure. Yeah, Yeah. death warmed up. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, The site goes on to recount what it calls a, quote, delightful story about Don Bradman. Let's see if you agree. (laughs) (laughs) The headmaster at the time was in the habit of wearing a bright red cardigan and went by the nickname to the school population as Robin Redbreast. He would daily ring the school bell to close the lunch break after considering his fob watch at the time. One day, when the young Bradman was batting, Robin Redbreast appeared beside the bell and while he was checking his watch, Don said, How's about I see if I can stop him ringing the bell? And with that, he hit the next ball straight at the teacher, knocking him to the ground. It's an evocative schoolyard tale, but sadly cannot be confirmed. He killed that man. As a I young just think boy, what a delightful story. He hit the principal in the temple and he died on sight. knocked him over. I read that in a few different places. He just he hit a ball at the headmaster on purpose, knocking him to the ground. What a delightful tale. How many other people did he, does he kill in this story? <laughs> The body count is large. <laughs> I didn't know that uh, one of his our test best average. sporting uh, heroes was also a serial killer. Cold-blooded killer. Hey, didn't feel nerves or, or <laughs> remorse. Yeah. No empathy. Yeah. Psychopath. Uh, Bradman left school at 14 years of age, which apparently was pretty common back then. He left with a positive report from the headmaster. Um, <laughs> who was terrified he was coming back for more. <laughs> who wrote... He is truthful, honest, and industrious, and an unusually bright lad. Yeah, no mention of knocking him down. Uh, in 1924, the Bradmans moved around the corner to Glebe Street and into a brick Californian bungalow-style home, which George, his father, built. The Bradman Foundation writes that Don was then an increasingly confident youngster of 15 and was already already known locally for his cricket prowess as he'd been very successful in the few school games he played. However, his primary activities around the house often included musical recitals. This is something I, de- I definitely didn't know about him. Don Bradman had been taught the piano by his elder sister Lillian, herself later to become a professional piano teacher, and often the living room of the house resonated with the sounds of piano, violin, and accordion with wonderful sing-songs, as L- Lillian later described them. Often the Bradmans would invite neighbours over to participate in these musical gatherings, so at times the modest lounge would have been very crowded. (laughs) That's a great, another delightful anecdote. Cannot be confirmed. (laughs) By the mid-20s, his cricket was starting to attract more attention from beyond the local area, according to the Bradman Foundation again. During the 1925-26 season playing for the Barrel Cricket Club, he scored 234 runs against the team from Wingello, a town located between Barrel and Goulburn. Bradman was a diminutive 16-year-old and played that innings against the fiery Bill O'Reilly, later to lead a distinguished career as an Australian test bowler. O'Reilly recalls his first encounter with Bradman played on Glebe Park, which would later be renamed Bradman Oval, which is fun. There's all these stories about him walking across um, Glebe Park on his way to school and different things, and it's funny to think, in a couple of decades, that's just going to be named after you. Wow, that's kind of cool. Um. Uh, so Bill O'Reilly um, later remembered uh, when the boy Bradman st- struck that memorable innings in 1925. He approached the wicket with what seemed like the diffident gait of a stopgap performer, 
What stuck me most about him was the difficulty he seemed to be having in taking normal steps as he approached. His pads seemed to reach right up to his navel. Even though his size suggested that he would be better fitted physically to have been riding winners at Randwick Racecourse, <laughs> he summoned up the energy required to land the ball right over the fence on half a dozen occasions. And that's uh, that was Bill O'Reilly recounting that in 1985, which is a real fun because he, he, he uh, even fully grown, he was always a small small guy for a, a sportsman. So it's fu- a funny image that the he was like struggling to even walk with the pads and then he'd go out and just smacked around these adults. Yeah. Pretty fun. I also like the writing there that he couldn't just say he looked like a jockey. Yeah. That's uh, that's ex-cricketer Bill O'Reilly for you. <laughs> Got away with words. Beautiful. Back then you couldn't only do one job. Uh, cricket didn't pay a lot, so most of them were also poets. Oh, yeah. and poetry, as we all know, pays big the big bucks. <laughs> yeah. Poetry and mime, I think, are the two best yes. paid in the arts industry, I believe. Certainly in the 30s. Jugglers, uh, but... I think, a third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, especially the ones at traffic lights. So that's one business people aren't talking about, which is, would be pretty hard hit in the lockdown. That's right. Uh, according to the Library of New South Wales, Bill O'Reilly was what rated by Don Bradman as the best bowler he had ever faced. Uh, By the end of the season, Bradman had broken the district record score by making 300 runs in the final play between Barrel and Mossvale. The innings caught the attention of the New South Wales state selectors. He was invited to a net session at the SCG in October of 1926. He impressed and was invited to join the Central Cumberland Cricket Club, but when they refused to compensate the loss of income he'd suffered from travelling to Sydney to play... So from, for Bradman to play in Sydney, he had to leave Barrel every Saturday to catch a train at 5 a.m. and wouldn't return till midnight. Oof. And he's like, if, I, if you want me to play, I just, I'll just need some, um, uh, some cash for that if that's okay. <laughs> and they're like, nah, you look very good, but you're not worth a bit of money. Uh, luckily, another club saw his potential and St. George jumped at the chance to sign him up. On the 27th of November, 1926, in Bradman's first match for St. George, he scored 110 in as many minutes. Scored pretty quick. Bradman continued to climb up the ranks when he was selected to represent his state for the 27-28 summer. Bradman moved to Sydney later in 1928, and this meant that he would avoid having to make the long return train journey for games, as well as allowing him to train with teammates on turf wickets during the week. So before that, he was uh, training on these Bush wickets that weren't even the same um, wickets he'd play on, on the weekend. So wow. This really helped his game, I imagine. And he's only 20 by yeah. this stage. So he was he was just a gun the whole way through. Dave, are you impressed by my quick maths? Wow. I, I'm i just catching up now. Because he was, was born quick? in 1908, you see, and then oh. this is in 1928. And what I did there was I quickly deduced there was about a 20-year difference there. I reckon that that was just a really lucky guess. <laughs> it wasn't. It was deduction. <laughs> you sure you weren't just rounding off yeah. and got lucky? It's deduction. I knew I was right. Oh, you deduced it. <laughs> Very good. Hey, do you reckon it's worth for overseas people just to explain briefly what that, cricket is? What cricket <laughs> is? Do you want to take us through the basics, Dave? Well, also, I just want to talk about how, like, you're saying he's scoring over 100 or 300 and all this sort of stuff, we should probably just say that that's a lot. Yes. Yes, for the listeners, not for the other people on the podcast (laughs) who perhaps don't know much about cricket. The listeners need to know how the scoring works. Obviously, we three do very well. Oh, yes, so much. A hundred is a lot. A hundred. It's like probably the equivalent of like a triple-double in basketball. Thank you. No, that would be more like uh, scoring a hundred and taking a couple of wickets, would it? I don't know. Is it like scoring 40 or 50 in basketball probably? Yeah. Something like that? That's a lot, yeah. In most games, you'd be probably the person who scored the most runs or points for your team basically. Yeah. Yeah. And he's doing that a lot. He's Mm. doing that at every level and every level he gets to, he dominates and goes up to the next level. So now he's at state level, which is the second highest level you can play in Australia or in the the world. Um, So impressed at state level, this first-class cricket is a.k.a., uh, racking up runs and was rewarded with his first baggy green cap, uh, getting the call up to the Australian team. The baggy green, that's sort of the, that's the symbol of, of um, playing test cricket for Australia. You get given a baggy green cap. These days you get it with the number you are, like you're the 643rd 
cricket at aware the baggy green. I have no idea how many people have played it. Probably not that high, is it? I don't but know. I was thinking that seemed low. It's a great honour. It's a great. Yes. Honor. They Big say honor. the uh, is it the Australian cricket team captain is the second most powerful job in Australia after the PM, or is it the other way around? <laughs> Who's got the nuclear codes? <laughs> it's the cricketers. We don't have that. <laughs> yeah, it's probably Michael Clark. Who's who can release the dingoes? <laughs> Michael Clark. Ma- yeah. Yeah. The, the captain from ten years ago. Yep. Yeah, that's right. Well, you've got to have experience. <laughs> Who's the captain now? Uh it's Payne, isn't it? Uh, I believe Tim Payne. Uh, is the test captain. Yes. Nice. Let's not date this episode. <laughs> Yes, sorry. Uh, Michael Clark, was it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, continue to talk about Don Bradman from the fucking 1920s. Yeah, don't date it, Matt. <laughs> Let's not date it. <laughs> Let's not talk about the past. I wrote, so the first half of this I wrote like three weeks ago and I'm <laughs> I'm real, it's very dry and I apologise. I think the second half I wrote with a bit more of an eye for it to be interesting. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> So stick around. We've got some good stuff coming up. <laughs> Everyone just hold on. No okay. wonder it's uh, really probably could have used an edit this one. <laughs> uh, anyway, look, he's he's just got his baggy green. Yeah. You know? Things are heating up. That's big. It's getting hot at the top. So he got his baggy green cap uh, and in only his 10th first class match, Bradman debuted for Australia, but he found it pretty tough. In fact, the whole side found it hard going. Uh, scoring only 66 in the second innings and losing the match to England by a whopping 675 runs. <laughs> Whoa. Bradman scored 18 and 1 in his two innings. As a result, Bradman was dropped to 12th man in the second test of the series, but this would be the only occasion Bradman would be dropped from the side in his career. He returned for the third test, played at the MCG in our home state and city of Melbourne, Victoria. God bless our boys. I can see it from my house when the when all the lights are on. When That's I close cool. my eyes, I can see it from my house too. <laughs> no, Matt, I'm not talking like metaphorically. God bless that fair stadia. <laughs> yeah, I know. I can see it from my house. Yes, I can see the lights are on. I can on. see it. I can see it right now. No, guys, I'm I'm <laughs> right serious. Here in my heart. I can I, literally see it. I can see it too. That frame. Oh my god. Photo of it on my wall. Oh, forget it. <laughs> I'm actually locked down in the MCG right now. Oh, I'm wow. I'm sleeping here. Wow. Sleeping on the grass. Well, wherever you were, that's where you had to stay. I know. Why don't you break into one of the private boxes? They've got to be a bit comfier. And I was wherever you were, you had to stay. And I was streaking on the MCG. <laughs> so I've got no so. clothes. <laughs> I've been on the MCG turf, I think, three times. What? At least three times. Once when I played uh, like halftime Little League footy between a Saints Essendon game. Were they doing that back in your day? <laughs> that was, I think it was the first time they tried That's it out. That's very cute. It was just a paddock. <laughs> Had to shoo some cows out of the way. And then one time, one time they do a, a fun run where you can you finish, you finish on the ground, which is kind of fun. And then the other time was when uh, a mate got married. He had his wedding after party thing at the MCG. And um, we went out and got photos on the ground. There was only this tiny little bit of grass they let you stand on, but that was kind of fun. That's cool. That's an that's an expensive wedding reception. Yeah, well, he had a hundred thousand people coming, so. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you limited then with. Yeah, and you know he charged, but everyone paid, so he made a tidy profit. I think. Was the celebrant Michael Clark? <laughs> Dave, don't date this episode. Don't date this episode with your dated now, references. Matt, please continue to talk about a very old dead cricketer. <laughs> oh, spoiler. <laughs> uh, so he, he got in for his second uh, second match at the top level and he showed what he could do, scoring 79 and 112, with the second inning scoring making him the youngest player to score a, tenth, a test century to that point at just 20 years of age. Record's been broken since, but at the time. It was a record. It was, it was a broken by, broken by Clarky. <laughs> I don't think Clarky did it. No, I think it's been to, broken multiple I swear times. Where to fucking God, Dave? Neil Harvey, <laughs> who I'll mention later. 
<laughs> bringing up Michael fucking Clark. He's... I'm going to murder you. <laughs> Remember he was in that glamour couple with uh, Laura Dingle? <laughs> hey? Laura Bingle? Yeah. Oh, oh no. <laughs> That was, that was nowhere near. Wasn't, no. I mean, it I was, mean, it was close. close. You knew what I was talking about. <laughs> Where the bloody hell was her name when I couldn't think of it. Um, there's one for the <laughs> one for the Australians. Uh, despite Bradman's scores, Australia again lost the match. In the fourth test, Australia lost again, this time by only 12 runs. Bradman looked set to take Australia to victory, but he was run out on 58. This would be the only time he was run out in his whole test career. Wow, because that's a pretty common way to go out, isn't it? So... Yeah, it's relatively common. Most batsmen would go out more than once in your third test. I think he, he was pretty stubborn and he he really learnt from his lessons. He's like, I'm not making that mistake again. He uh, he He's sort of pretty famous for not hitting many sixes. Made so many runs, but very few of them sixes. And his theory was if you hit it along the ground, you can't get caught out. So he... Um, he barely hit it in the air. Like he was just sort right. of wily and smart as well as being oh. sort of brilliant. And Jess, I'm not sure if you know, but of, of course a six being when he hit it over the fence on the full, a bit like a home run, if you will. In basketball. Mm. Yes. Uh, yes. Now that I'm familiar with. <laughs> and, Dave, you don't have to explain it to me. If you feel at any point you need to explain some of the lingo to our listeners, please, by all means. Mm. Um, I, I won't step on your toes there. But, I mean, I, I get it, obviously. I the, love way it. I I read that, the way I read that was Dave was talking to Jess, sort of a personification of the listener. Do you mm. think of me as the listener of this <laughs> podcast? Yeah. I think of you as the dumb listener that I need to explain <laughs> things to. <laughs> I don't know if there was any need for that, <laughs> Dave, but there you go. His true colours come out uh, for everyone to see. So I was just thinking about if I was listening to a, a baseball podcast, yeah. they always talk about like the hitting average and all that sort of stuff. Mm. It means absolutely nothing to me. So just in case, I'm just trying to do the reversal here. Yeah, and I always get confused about the scoring in cricket as well. So you're saying some numbers and I'm like, I mean, those are big numbers. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if I say numbers, they're normally noteworthily big. You, you seem to have a pretty good test batting average at, in the 40s is sort of pretty good. 40 yeah, and damn. above is sort of 40 is about the par. To be decent, into the fifties, you're brilliant, and he's wow. he's hitting these um, bigger scores regularly. Um, so, but he started in a time where Australia's doing it pretty tough against, and at this time, the two major powers in cricket, world cricket, are, are Australia and England. It's got the oldest rivalry, uh, and yeah, at that point, Australia no good compared to the English, um, but. As he sort of settled into the team, they seemed to improve. Each test match in this series, his first series, they did a little bit better. And Australia finally broke through to win in the fifth and final test of the series with Bradman instrumental scoring 123 and 37 not out. Uh, this only added a slight tinge of respectability to the series with England pulling down Australia's pants overall, <laughs> four tests to one, and they retained the Ashes. It's fun to read these words that I wrote three weeks ago. I don't re recall writing down the phrase pulling down Australia's pants. <laughs> but, you know, uh, in these tougher times, I've had to look to earn uh, money in a different way and I've, I've, I've looked to poetry. So you <laughs> yeah. might get a little bit of that. And from pulling down people's pants. Yes. Yes, I will do that for money. Um, <laughs> Dak for cash is my website. <laughs> look it up. Uh, here's a fun fact with information from Wikipedia. Until World War II, this this kind of blew my... I think I vaguely knew this, but I think this might be uh, interesting for you too and maybe some of the listeners as well. Until World War II, all tests in Australia were timeless, unlike Dave's reference to Michael Clarke. <laughs> uh, what does time, that mean? A timeless test match... Well, Dave, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> A timeless test match is a match of test cricket played under no limitation of time, which means the match is played until one side wins or the match is tied, with theoretically no possibility of a draw. The format means that it is not possible to play defensively for a draw when the allotted time runs out, 
and delays due to bad weather will not prevent the match ending with a positive result. Only two of these matches were drawn, both against England in 1882, when the matches had to be left unfinished owing to shipping schedules. <laughs> There's no time limit, but there is a shipping schedule, I'm afraid, so we're going to have We've to call it a day. We've got a ship to catch. <laughs> or is it like, sorry, we're going to, this cricket ground is becoming a dock tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. so you've got to get We've got some ships coming in, <laughs> and they're coming in hot. <laughs> Uh, pitches were left uncovered during matches. These days they'll cover the pitches to um, uh, keep them protected from the elements. But back then they were left uncovered during the matches and in the Australian climate the well-watered prepared pitches would dry out and crack and crumble as the match progressed, usually making batting more difficult by the fourth or fifth day. Uh, the longest test match in Australia was the fifth test between Australia and England in Melbourne in 1929, which lasted for eight playing days. Not oh. eight days. There were also days off in between. <laughs> it's like it's. It, I love. It's just such a funny old school way to play sport that takes yeah. days. I mean, they still play it over five days, but over eight days. Uh, I think it was nine or ten days all together, with including days off. It's uh, it's pretty fun. I've never heard that. I did not know that, and I am actually you know, a bit of a cricket fan. I like watching it. And the, the tests, as you say, these days go for five days and that does seem like a long, long time, especially when it's a best of five series. So there's 25 yeah. days all up and it goes for about six weeks. <laughs> um, but unlimited, that's crazy. Yeah, isn't that funny? Uh, but I think, yeah. So although the format should guarantee a result, it was ultimately abandoned as it was impossible to predict with any certainty when a match would be finished, making scheduling and commercial aspects difficult. So that's why the timeless tests were brought to an end. People mm. had shit to do, basically. Yeah, probably a good idea to end it. <laughs> it's yeah, it's so funny, but I I love the idea. I kind of wish they'd do that every once a decade. One Ashes Test is timeless, and they just play it out. Yeah, that'd be cool. I actually wish more things had time limits, <laughs> like social gatherings. Okay, or I thought you were like... talking about this podcast right now. <laughs> Oh, that would be nice, but I, that's, I'm not that much of a dreamer. Um, but I just mean like, you know, we'll go out for brunch from 10 till 12. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then everybody, fuck off. Well, I think that's why it's smart, if you can, to just go, oh, I've got a heart out. I'm so sorry. I've got an appointment at yeah. 12. It's very important. And then when you do that with someone and they go, oh, no, I, I think it's been cancelled, you'd be like, oh, you're enjoying yourself. Oh, <laughs> you love me. <laughs> so a Bradman had now arrived on the international stage. I'll let you know when I get to the part that I wrote this week. I'm still not <laughs> okay. there yet. Okay. So Bradman had arrived, but it wasn't until the return series in England the following year that he truly showed how great he was. A special send-off was organised at Barrel's Empire Theatre with the local community in attendance. Bradman called the event the proudest evening of my life. Oh, that's nice. It's so fun, like this this world-beating cricketer and he's just in this little country town hall getting sent off by, you know, a couple hundred people. So fucking cool. Love that's it. lovely. Uh, despite Bradman already showing he was a special talent, his critics suggested he wouldn't be able to replicate the form in England. Sure, you can score runs on your little Australian pitches, but come over here and try that on our proper English wickets and we'll see what you've really got, they probably said. Mm. He but headed... they would have settled in an accent. Oh, no. <laughs> uh... mm -hmm. <clears throat> Here we go. Good day. Uh, good day. No, that's not them. What's theirs? Good no, day. It's ours. Good day. Sure, you can score runs on your little Australian pitches. Come over here and try that on our proper English wickets and we'll see what you really got. <laughs> they probably said. Was yeah. that the Queen when she was like six? Oh, that was just one of the people who sound like the Queen. Right. All they of them. all sound like the Queen all over there. All of them. They look up to her. She's very influential. <laughs> they used to speak a different language before her. And she said, I've come up with something. It's called the Queen's English. Let's see what you think. And they're like, sorry, don't know what you're saying. But they said that <laughs> in the language they used to speak. He headed to England as a 21-year-old, and according to the Bradman Trail, Bradman was an instant sensation in England, making a double century in the first match at Wars. <laughs> Worcester? Yes, Worcester, which set the scene for his record. It's written Worcester, but I think it's Worcester. Yeah. Look forward to the tweets. <laughs> like Worcestershire sauce. Yeah. It's written like Worcestershire. Yes. 
<laughs> Have you seen that video of an old Italian man trying to say Worcestershire? <laughs> No, but I want to. It's so funny. Worcestershire. Doesn't make sense. He has has a convulsion while he's trying to say it. I get it. I mean, did you just see me try and say it? I think it was very similar. And I am one-eighth Swiss Italian, so it makes sense. I have Uh, fond memories of some of my dad's golfing buddies coming around for lunch one day, two of them English, one of them a very old Australian man uh, at the time. Is he still alive? I think he is. So he's incredibly old now. Uh, and he kept saying, it's Worcestershire. And they're going, it's Worcestershire. And he's like, read the bottle. It says Worcestershire. I'm with him. And I was about 14 having a great laugh in the corner. That's a fun argument. Yeah. Your dad knows how to party. That's what yeah. I love about him. He knows people who know how to party, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah big time. He's party adjacent. Yes. So he made his double century. Uh, and the first match at Worcester set the scene for his record-breaking summer to follow. He scored no less than six double centuries, ten centuries, and 15 half centuries. The giant world record score of 334 made during the third test at Headingley proved beyond doubt that there was an exceptional test player here. Throughout, his, throughout this success, his unwavering modesty and bright personality made him a favourite with the England people despite the flogging he was giving their bowlers. Be- oh, was he ugly? Bright personality. That means he's ugly. You haven't seen pictures of him? He looks like he, you know. Bit of an uggo, hey. Yeah, he pretty looks kind of like he could be related to me. So, yeah. So... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's got a bright personality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, he became a, and it goes on to say, he became a pin-up boy and his successes were eagerly received back in Australia. So, you know, papered over those cracks, so to speak. <laughs> I think that means literally he became a pin-up boy. Glamour shots. <laughs> At the end of the tour, he had amassed a total of 2,960 runs, which was more than twice the number of runs than Alan Kipax, the player who completed the second most number of innings. So wow, he, you know, he, he dominated. I mean, those runs, that uh, world record score of 334 stood for a long time. And um, I think it stood until I was alive, so... <laughs> Quite a long, so, long time. So he scored nearly 3,000 runs in one series. Well, no, it wasn't the one series. That was one tour. So they play out um, matches against local teams and other things as well. So against county teams and mm, different bits right. and pieces okay, as well. So that's all together, yeah. That, I was going to say because these days if you get 10,000 in your career, you're in the history books. Yeah. That's test. So that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I forget you're a, a cricket man, Dave. I've been watching it, uh, the English cricket summer lately. We should talk. Let's talk. Your people call my people right. about cricket. <laughs> we'll do it later. We won't talk about cricket now. We'll talk about the Don. He's above cricket. Uh, yeah, so those stats did include tour matches, uh, but for the five-match test series, Bradman scored 974 in only seven innings, a record that still stands today. What? It is insane. So it, we're saying before, 100 is a, gr- a great scorer in an, in an innings. He scored 974 in seven innings, so... Pretty bloody good. Uh, wow. During the series, a song called Our Don Bradman was released back in Australia. How fun is this? <laughs> it was written by Jack O'Hagan and was recorded by a vo- uh, with a vocal by Art Leonard. Here are some of the lyrics. Who is it that all Australia raves about? Who has won our very highest praise? Now it isn't Amy Johnson or Little Mickey Mouse. No, it's just a country lad who's bringing down the house and he's chorus our don bradman <laughs> now i ask you is he any good our don bradman i mean check that before you write the song right why is he asking <laughs> yeah. questions like that mid song um, why am i writing a song about this bloke is he any good <laughs> is he any good our don bradman as a batsman he can sure lay on the wood for when he goes into bat he knocks every record flat for there isn't anything he cannot do our Don Bradman, every Aussie dips his lid to you. <laughs> oh, I love dip your lid. Yeah. I love it so much. And it was a hit. Apparently the sheet music sold 40,000 copies within a few days. Far out. He was, he was climbing up the sheet music charts. 40,000 <laughs> copies of the sheet music. What is that even? What a different time. Oh, it's fantastic. It's so they could, it, they could play it at home. Yeah, I th- yeah, I guess it, maybe it was pre-gramophones. Uh, it wasn't. 
<laughs> but at the time, they weren't sure what was going to be the the biggest mode of of uh, music. Was it going to be people playing the music on a record, or was it going to be you know the instructions to do it yourself? <laughs> <laughs> DIY music. <laughs> Pretty fun. <laughs> so that's forty thousand copies in a few days. At that time, Australia's yeah. population was six and a half million. So that's Dave. You could do the sums, but that's like I think that's two for every person. Two for every person. That's amazing. I think that's about right. That yeah. is amazing. Um, that's a, that's also too many copies, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. One is enough. That's what are you going to do with the other one? Oh, frame it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One to frame. Cool. One to use. Yeah, that makes sense. One's dog-eared, <laughs> and the other one's pristine. <laughs> It'll be a collector's item. I reckon it probably probably would be. Yeah. They didn't use to keep things back then, did they? Real disposable society back in the 30s. The same year a song Bradman himself wrote. Uh, so I mentioned before how he played a lot of piano. That same year a song he wrote himself was released titled Every Day is a Rainbow Day for Me. Oh, no. It was recorded. <laughs> this was- is like Shaquille O'Neal <laughs> rapping. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. It was recorded. Every day is a <laughs> rainbow day for me. <laughs> I, I mean, that, and we all know it well. We all know it. What's a rainbow day? Well, it's a term that has caught on since that day and we all say it. It's now our national anthem. Have a rainbow day. I never knew where our national anthem came yeah. from, but there it is. It should be. I mean, I don't love our national anthem. It's a bit, a bit sort of slow and plodding. But I reckon every day is a rainbow day for me would be a banger. <laughs> I guess the kind of one to get you going. Al Don Bradman. <laughs> Bradman. That's it. It's in my head from your version. <laughs> I don't even, I I assume that's how it goes. Is he any good? <laughs> <laughs> but is he any good? <laughs> but he's lying on wood. <laughs> that's fantastic stuff. Uh, good. So Every Day is a Rainbow Day for Me was recorded by Columbia Studios in 1930. It's starting to sound like, I mean, apparently it was pretty good at piano, but it does also have the vibe of, Someone being very good at something and then just being surrounded by yes men. Mm. I want to release a song. Well, yeah, you should. You should, Don Bradman. I reckon. Every Day is a Rainbow Day for me. Sounds like a hit. Uh, I don't think it was a hit. It was recorded (coughs) by Columbia Studios in 1930 and commercially released. Uh, Not heaps seems to be known about it, but apparently he was a pretty handy pianist. 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 According to the Bradman Foundation, upon his return to Australia... He's, he was subjected to an almost frenzied series of public engagements that took him away from his shipboard teammates steaming around the coast. As he, People were proposing to him in the streets. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I mentioned it a bit later on, but some of his teammates, I think, um, maybe don't love all the attention that gets heaped on him. And he's also meant to be, he's not the most social sort of, um, he's a bit of a an aloof guy, keeps to himself a bit, so... Um, some of his teammates didn't think he was uh, the best guy. Some people have sort of said maybe he was a bit of an asshole. I like to think he was just <laughs> misunderstood. But imagine that you're getting shipped around as a team and your star player gets off, goes, get, uh, hangs out with adoring fans for a while while you're waiting on the ship. Then he comes back, you go to the next spot so he can go do that again. Imagine you would start to probably feel some animosity. It's like... They're like the support band for him. Yeah. That's what touring with you guys feels like, though, to be honest. I'm like, all right, I'll pack up here. You take photos with your adoring fans. That's funny because like, it's ah! the opposite of what happens. <laughs> Very good joke, Jess. Ha, 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 So then he, he um, finally on the 4th of November 1930, he arrived back in Barrel to be reunited with his parents and family and attended a civic reception in the town's Corbett Gardens. He was escorted to the dais with strains of the tune, Our Don Bradman Filling the Air. Uh, How does that one go again? Our <laughs> Don Bradman, tell us, is he any good? I love how he used to sing in the 30s or whenever. Our Don oh, oh, Bradman. <laughs> Genuinely, that's, I reckon that's sick stuff. That's real cool stuff. So... Oh, oh, here we go. Here's a bit of extra information. This recently released Foxtrot song was a huge hit of the day and was eagerly sung by thousands of Australians celebrating the triumph of the young man over England's finest test players. Foxtrot. What kind of music is a Foxtrot? Um, uh, yep. <laughs> 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 That's 
Foxtrot. I assume. Foxtrot. No. Uh, Charleston, Foxtrot, it's all the same. Mm. Yeah, I mean, time. I did start the episode by saying we are forming a dance troupe and we do not know any dancers. <laughs> I know the cha-cha. Oh, we all know the cha-cha. No, no, I, lo- I know Joni loves chachi. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> What's a chachi? <laughs> uh, uh, Jess just pulled up a photo of, of Don and, yeah, also did the, did the uh, fanning the face a sign, meaning Stone Cold Stunner. Yep. In that photo. In others, yeah, but that one. He grows into know. looking like everyone's granddad. Maybe not everyone's yeah. granddad, my granddad. Does <laughs> everyone's granddad look like my granddad? <laughs> you know when you fall for the trap of assuming your experience is universal? Yeah, everyone's granddad. Brian O'Connor, mm. yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Mine's called Eddie. Oh, oh that's weird. Yeah. Oh, so... Still O'Connor. Oh, but... okay, sure. <laughs> My Brian was called Jim. <laughs> What's your Brian's name? Send us a message. <laughs> Bradman continued scoring centuries when the West Indies and uh, South African teams toured, averaging over 200 against South Africa. In these two series, Australia won nine of the ten matches. They're on fire. Do- it's about 90%. Don had him absolutely flying. Averaging 200 in a series is wild as well. Uh, South African fast bowler Sandy Bell said bowling to Bradman was, quote, heartbreaking. (laughs) (laughs) Going on to say, uh, with his sort of cynical grin, which rather reminds one of the Sphinx, he never seems to perspire. (laughs) Is he man or is he robot? Heartbreaking. He can't sweat like Prince Andrew. Yeah. Shot at during the Falklands. (laughs) I don't sweat. Despite dominating at test level, his most devastating performance that season perhaps came in a club match. I'll read the story as recounted by Martin Williamson for ESPN Cricket. All right, we're into the stuff I wrote this week. All right, I was about to ask, but good, we've caught up. On Monday, November the 2nd, 1931, Bradman and New South Wales teammate Wendell Bill travelled into the Blue Mountains about 60 miles from Sydney to play in a match to open a new pitch at Blackheath. The two stars named were included in the Blackheath 11 against neighbouring Lithgow. So he's a dominating player at this point. Now he's going to play this little country game, which is a bit of fun. And he's brought a teammate along. Two international players <laughs> yeah. are now playing for a... You'd be pissed off if you started bowling to him. A little bit, but also they brought in a huge crowd, raising money for the teams. And, like, they were doing him a huge favour. Right, so it's a bit of an honour, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bradman was soon in full flow, uh, taking 30 off off 38 off the first over he faced. Back then it was eight, eight ball overs. I was going to say otherwise, how is that possible? Yeah, these days it's only six ball overs. You can only really hit six maximum. 36, although, you know, if there's no balls or whatever, but still. Uh, yeah, 38 off an eight ball over, over is still pretty handy. I didn't understand any of that, but I, I think he's good. So uh, this is for the listeners. Uh, yes, the listeners. Fill them in. So... An over is, it used to be eight balls apparently, but these days it's six. One bowler will bowl from one end of the wicket at six deliveries uh, and then they'll switch and another bowler will bowl from the other end, six, and they'll switch end to end. So the ground sort of switches. That did not make it any clearer, did it? No, I think it did. So with a large crowd gathered, Bradman was soon in full flow. After the 38 he took, um, he quickly got up to 100. (laughs) And then a bowler named Bill Black was brought on. Bradman casually asked wicketkeeper Leo Waters what to expect. Waters replied, don't you remember this bloke? He bowled you in an exhibition match in Lithgow a few weeks ago and has been boasting about it ever since at your expense. Uh Oh, Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. Oh, no. They've just told Michael Jordan he can't do (laughs) something. It really made me think of Michael Jordan and the the last dance doco. I think this bowler's about to die. <laughs> well, do you reckon I could hit him? <laughs> Let's stop him ringing that bell. What are you talking about? It's a callback from my childhood. <laughs> it's a callback to an unconfirmed event from my childhood. A delightful tale, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently Black had bowled Bradman for 52 in an upcountry match, a feat that caused the supposedly impartial local umpire to yell, Bill, you've got him. 
<laughs> that is so funny. Bill, my son. Think of an <laughs> yelling that out. Oh, shit, you got him. <laughs> Uh, the ball was mounted. So the ball that he bowled Bradman with was mounted and Black had been dining out on the moment ever since. Get out of town. He's fucked right now. So Bradman ambled down the pitch to chat with Wendell Bill and reportedly said, I think I'll have a go. (laughs) What followed was brutal. In three (laughs) eight ball overs, he scored exactly 100 runs. Three overs (laughs) with Wendell Bill. So normally it'd it'd be it's great to score a ton in a day. He's done it in what they estimate to be about eighteen minutes. It is fuck. Well, I I'm like what I I had to find this on multiple sources before I even believed it. The first over from Black went for thirty three runs. The second from the blameless Horry. The article says the blameless Horry Baker uh, was for forty, and the third again from Black for twenty nine. But that did include two singles that uh, Wendell Bill had to just hit to get um, Bradman back on strike. So it was a couple of basically waste balls in that. Otherwise, it would have been even more. Uh, apparently, after the, after the 100 came up in those three overs, a bewildered Baker demanded to be taken off. He's like, I'm not bowling another I'm not bowling another <laughs> over. Please don't make me bowl another wow. over. Wow. Uh, while Bradman was eventually dismissed for 256, including 14 sixes and 29 fours, Wendell Bill made 68. It's important, I think, to emphasise that the thing was not planned, Bradman said years later. It happened purely by accident and everyone was surprised at the outcome. No one more than I. (laughs) Wendell Bill became one of my staunchest friends and in later years he said he got more notoriety out of the two singles he scored in those three overs than anything else he ever did in his life. (laughs) (laughs) After the match, Bradman presented the bat he used to the Blackheath mayor, who had it mounted on a wall in the council offices. It was said he asked people to swear on it when an honest response was needed. <laughs> like it was a <laughs> like Bible. swearing on the Bible. <laughs> Swear on Bradman's bat. That is now on... And they're like, I couldn't, I can't. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't lie to the bat. Uh, and you, if you wanted to see that bat, you can still see it. It's at the Bradman Museum in Barrel. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. On the 30th of April 1932, Bradman married his childhood sweetheart, Jessie Menzies, at St. Paul's Church in Burwood, Sydney. They honeymooned in Melbourne before heading to North America in what Bradman described as an extended honeymoon. It was also a cricket tour. (laughs) In North America? Yeah. So it was a private tour which was organised by former Test cricketer Arthur Maley and was in part to try and boost the reputation of cricket in the US and Canada. And obviously it was very Very, successful. It's now the national sport in Canada. Yeah. And America. <laughs> uh, the newlyweds arrived in Vancouver, Canada on the 16th of June, and according to a, a biography by Michael Page for the State Library of South Australia, in 75 days, the Australians travelled almost 10,000 kilometres across Canada and the USA. They played 51 matches, including one in Hollywood, against a team that included actor Boris Karloff. Whoa. Does that name mean to, anything to you? Yeah, he played like the the mummy and yes, and he played Frankenstein. And... That famous picture of Frankenstein from the 1931 film Frankenstein. He played Frankenstein's monster, and ah. also in the follow-ups, uh, Bride of Frankenstein and Son of Frankenstein. So Bradman played against Frankenstein, which is kind of fun. <laughs> the other thing I think he's maybe most famous for. Um, was that he narrated and voiced the titular character in Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. You know that famous TV special? I think it's played in like Home Alone and stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yep, yep. So, Because I was thinking that was Jim Carrey. <laughs> <laughs> That's a re- that shows our age difference, doesn't it? I think of the 1960s yeah. version of it. Mm. Uh, Matt, uh, that's Mike Myers and his name is Shrek. So <laughs> get it right. You look really stupid right now. Damn it. <laughs> While in New York, Bradman attended a baseball game between the Yankees and the White Sox as the guest of none other than legendary baseballer Babe Ruth. So he's kind of the Tom Bradman of baseball and vice versa, I guess. You you yeah. two would have heard of Babe Ruth. I've always known Babe him Ruth's as just like the baseball legend. Yeah, I just knew him as a lefty, a famous but lefty. But that did help give it some context when I read that he was like the, uh, he was baseball's Tom Bradman. Um <laughs> So th- that analogy was actually used recently, last year actually, when US President Donald Trump was doing a press conference with Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison with Australian billionaire Anthony Pratt. 
when Pratt told Trump, the PM is the Don Bradman of Australian job creation. (laughs) (laughs) Trump looked confused before Pratt quickly followed up saying, Don Bradman was our Babe Ruth. And Trump replied, (laughs) oh, wow. And then Morrison added, in cricket. (laughs) It is one of the greatest bits of foreign diplomacy that I've ever witnessed. (laughs) Wow. It's so cringy. (laughs) <laughs> it's, uh, it's so much fun. I mean, that phrase, I think we all think of Prime Minister Scott Morrison as the Don Bradman of Australian job creation. I mean, yeah, obviously. <laughs> that's uh, that's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. Bradman and Babe apparently chatted. They got on quite well. Um, so I don't know, did I mention that they, yeah, um, so they were watching it in Babe Ruth's box. I think Ruth was injured at the time. But they got on well. Uh, Ruth was a big guy. I didn't know this. He stood at over six foot tall. He was around 100 kilos. And uh, he was expecting Bradman to be a similar size. Everyone's saying, this guy, he smashes it around just like you. And uh, so this is what he apparently said to Bradman. He said, from what they were telling me, I thought you were a husky and strong guy. <laughs> Bradman replied, but us little fellows can hit them harder than the big ones. <laughs> <laughs> when Ruth was asked by reporters what he thought about cricket, he said, They tell me $40 a week is top pay in cricket. I'll stick with baseball. (laughs) All about the cash with Babe. Was that, yeah, was that the question? Was that the question? Oh, I'm sorry, did I just ask you, what do you think about the pay discrepancies between the two sports? What do you think? No, they didn't ask that. They just, it was a polite chit chat question. So there was, it attracted a lot of press. There was a lot of press there. The next day, the New York Times described Bradman as, quote, the wild man of cricket. Yes. And also the ring-tailed wallaby of the cricket crease. Okay. Okay, so the ring, ring-tailed wallaby, that's kind of like our <laughs> Babe Ruth of the animal yes. world. Yes. That's catchy, though, don't you think? The ring-tailed wallaby of the cricket crease, the wild man of the wicket. Have they combined a couple of yeah, animals Yeah, I'm thinking there? ring-tailed possum. Possum. And then just wallaby. But our possums are different to their possums. Yeah, they're old. So I understand you don't say ringtail possum because then they'd be like, "What do you yeah. mean? Uh, we've got different." Our possums. possums are cute. Some of them are the little ones. Our ringtails are shit. Yeah. Oh my but god, this so does cute. sound like they are just making up animals, like the sugar gliding echidna of the wicket. <laughs> yeah. Especially if if America doesn't understand cricket, I mean, it just sounds baffling. You're just combining two things they haven't heard of: a ringtailed wallaby and a cricket crease. Oh, now we get it. Oh, he's the ring-tailed wallaby of the cricket crease. Sure, why don't you say so? Obviously. But who is he in terms of Babe Ruth? <laughs> uh, on the American tour, Bradman played in every match and amassed 3,779 runs at an average of 102.1. Who's just going around smacking it up? Uh, Bradman's dominance of the Poms in 1930, so we're talking, we've talked about it a little while ago where he had that record 334 and whatnot. Uh, led to the English devising a new tactic for the 1932-33 Australian tour, what would become known as the infamous Body Line Series. According to the National Museum of Australia, the 1932-33 Ashes Series is the most controversial in the history of Australian English Test cricket. The English team, desperate to contain Australian batsman Don Bradman and win back the Ashes, adopted a controversial strategy. Technically known as Fast Leg Theory, it was better known as Body Line. In preparing for their 1932 tour of Australia, England sought a way to stifle Bradman's scoring. Their captain, Douglas Jardine, developed an approach in which the ball was bowled fast and short, rising up to the batman's batman's body while fielders hovered close to the leg side. The strategy was intended to intimidate the batsman, stifle the swing of his bat and force him to play defensively, but it also posed a genuine physical threat. The relationship between Jardine and Australian cricket fans was already tense. During the 1928-29 tour to Australia, he was perceived as supercilious and rude. His air of upper-class superiority rankled with the Australian crowds. Back in the 1930s, beyond pads and gloves, batsmen wore very little protection, no helmet, no thigh pad, no arm pad, no chest guards. Um, So you'd be pretty familiar with the Bodyline series, Dave, at least the idea of it. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty dangerous, right, for the, the batters? Yeah, so it was um, very bloody. A lot of players were going off injured and just um, it was a battle of attrition sort of thing. 
Uh, and this is the two it Jess, you know, in the Paul Kelly song where he quotes um, quotes an Australian cricketer in the rooms after the game, and he says mm. two teams are out there today, but only one of them's playing cricket. That was about this series. Yes. Yeah. 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 Basically saying this is this is unsportsmanlike. It's not real cricket. Uh, Bradman missed the first test due to illness, which England won. He returned for the second test and scored a century, leading Australia to victory and levelling the series at one all. Going into the third test in Adelaide, Jardine decided to bring in the bodyline tactics, especially deploying his fast bowler, Harold Larwood, to ignore the stumps and instead bowl fast and short at the body. Maybe um, people who don't know cricket might not know the cricket balls are very hard. Oh, yeah. Hard as a rock and they bowl fast bowlers and cricket bowl very fast. Yep. 100 and... What is it? What the, I don't know what the fast bowlers were bowling back then, but these days, like 140k High 150s. is pretty fast. 150 is yeah. super fast. Uh, I, I like how I'm trying to explain to Americans and I'm using kilometres per hour. Um, 100 mile an hour or plus, I think, is real fast. Yeah. That would be real fast in anyone's language, right? Even American. The rest of the world understands cricket. This is only Americans we're talking to. Well, if only they'd caught on when we tried to teach them about it. I mean, it. we sent Don. What are we going to do? Send Michael, Michael Clark? Clark? <laughs> Cuz that's our that's our <laughs> last resort. There. We'll do it. <laughs> Clarky. That will date the well, lessons. What do you though. want? Yeah, that's right. It's amazing that still to this day cricketers still only get paid 40 bucks a week. <laughs> that's why that's how Michael Clark got around in his Lamborghini. Paying that 40 bucks a week. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, yeah, so this was this was when they brought in the brutal body line. Um, according to NMA, the already hostile crowd was furious and when one delivery struck Australian captain Bill Woodfull just above the heart, it was feared a riot would start. Tempers flared on the field and in the stands and while Woodfull maintained a diplomatic stance in public, in private he too was furious. Oof. <laughs> According to the State Library of New South Wales, as well as Bill Woodfull being struck down, the team wicketkeeper Bert Oldfield suffered a fractured skull. Oh, shit. According to the Bradman Foundation, at the end of the day's play, the England manager Sir Pelham Plum Warner visited the Australian dressing room <laughs> to commiserate with the injured. The Australian captain, cap, uh, the Australian captain Bill Woodfull, is reputed to have received him icily with the words, I don't want to see you, Mr Warner. <laughs> there are two teams out there. One is trying to play cricket, the other is not. I like how Paul Kelly put it better, but well, I mean, yeah. he's a poet. A people's so poet. That's why he gets paid the big bucks. The, the state <laughs> library did note that the quote new tactic even split the English side. The fast bowler George Gubby Allen refused to bowl body line despite the urgings of his captain Douglas Jardine. Gubby Allen described Jardine as a perfect swine in a letter to his parents, Sir Walter and Lady Allen. It's a perfect swine. He's the perfect swine. Such a fancy pig. That's a good yeah, compliment. That's a nice compliment. Yeah, the perfect piggy. <laughs> so that seems pretty noble of Allen, you know, to be um, going, I'm not going to play those dirty tactics even if my captain's asking me to. So you won't be surprised a man showing such um, heart and uh, ethics you won't be surprised to hear that he was Australian born and moved to England at the age of seven for school. Ah, uh, mm, that makes sense. <laughs> I felt that. Yeah. I felt it. Australians wouldn't change. Australians don't do dodgy stuff. Certainly not on the cricket field. No. I mean, there's, there's a couple of sandpapery <laughs> issues and, you know, pretty full on sledging, but. Well, that was just a misunderstanding. misunderstanding. See, the boys had just come from the job yep. site as Sanders yep. and uh, they just happened to have a little bit of the sandpaper left over in their They pockets. couldn't get a job as a poet, so they had to take the next best thing, sanding. <laughs> <laughs> they only get paid 40 bucks a week. <laughs> the NMA continues, a key aspect of Australian frustration was that the English tactics seemed to go against all that was valued in cricket, fair play, ethical conduct and a shared cultural understanding of behaviour. In response to the danger faced by the players, the Australian Board of Control for International Cricket sent a tersely worded telegram to the MCC on the 18th of January 1933. This is what it said. Bodyline bowling has assumed such proportions as to menace the best interests of the game, making protection of the body by the batsman the main consideration. This is causing intensely bitter feeling between the players as well as injury. In our opinion, it is unsportsmanlike. Unless stopped at once, 
it is likely to upset the friendly relations existing be- between Australia and England. Pretty strong words in those old timey ways. Is that? And was they saying that relations as cricket teams or as nations? I think they were talking bigger than that. Yeah, nations. Wow. Uh, the English administrators wow. did not appreciate their players being accused of unsportsmanlike behaviour. Not having witnessed the barrage of body blows, because they, they weren't out here in Australia for it, this is all telegram back to England, back and forth, they felt that the Australian side was making excuses. The MCC responded sternly on the 23rd of January, quote, We, Marlebone Cricket Club, deplore your cable. We deprecate your opinion that there has been unsportsmanlike play. We hope the situation is not now as serious as your cable would seem to indicate. But if it is such as to jeopardise the good relationships between English and Australian cricketers and you consider it desirable to cancel remainder of program, we would consent, but with great reluctance. It's so sassy. Mm. <laughs> we'll let you if you need to. If you need to quit, Sean, go That's ahead. That's fine. Hey, hey, that's all right. If you want to be a little bitch, <laughs> you want to be a little sooky bitch and oh, quit. Oh, fractured skull. It's okay. Oh, no. oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did your head hurt? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Did I split your head in two? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I hit you just above the heart? Oh, I'm sorry. After intervention from the Australian Prime Minister, Joseph Lyons, the Australian Board of Control withdrew its charge of unsportsmanlike behaviour and the final tests were played. England won the series 4-1 and reclaimed the ashes. So the Australian Prime Minister, England had to get involved. They the Politics did get involved and the... Prime Minister had to tell the Australian Cricket Board to back off, basically. Weird. What a weird page in history. Very weird. And for any international listeners, the Australian Prime Minister is like the Don Bradman of job creation. (laughs) If that clears that up for you. (laughs) That makes sense now. Oh, sorry. He's Australia's best. Isn't there something so undignified about a billionaire sucking up to political leaders like that? This guy, yeah, it's disgusting. Best. He's actually... He's like, honestly, he's like so good at job creation, hey. <laughs> okay. Mate, you're a billionaire. Come on. Yeah, maybe you could create fucking jobs. How do you think you became a billionaire though? Yeah, I think being good to the working man, no doubt about that, and woman. And children. <laughs> yeah, almost definitely children. Um, the working children. Have we slowly morphed into a commie podcast? Um, Slowly. Anyway, Mm. that's what I tell my butler. Um, (laughs) The impact of England's body line tactics extended beyond the cricket pitch. Struggling with ongoing hardship during the Depression, Australians saw the aggressive tactics of the English team as representative of England's wider attitude to the country. So it was was seen as a bigger thing. It It was representing England basically looking down their noses at us in the colonies sort of thing. Uh, Bradman finished the series with an average of only 56.57, a disappointing number for the Don. To put this into context, though, this is still a higher number than the career batting average of legendary cricketers like India's Sachin Tendulkar, the West Indies' Brian Lara, and South Africa's Jacques Callis. He did. He got that ton away before um, they brought in the body line tactics, though, admittedly. Uh, the Bradman Foundation concludes that there was never a formal acknowledgement from the England authorities that bodyline bowling was unsportsmanlike, but subsequent actions indicated a recognised culpability. Douglas Jardine would never again captain England against Australia, while Harold Lahr would never play Test cricket again, despite topping the English first-class bowling averages in 1937. Another legacy of the tactic was a change in the cricket rules. Bodyline was banned and a, and a new law was introduced to prevent no more than two fieldsmen gathering between square leg and the wicketkeeper. If we really want to baffle non-cricket listeners, we should start talking fielding positions. Silly mid-off. Silly mid-off is a, is a, is a classic. Cow's corner. Is that one? <laughs> yeah. Gully. Fine leg. That's something I think of uh, myself as having <laughs> I, in, in the way that it is very thin. These are very perplexing positions. Oh, there's also one called Big Dick. Yeah, Big Dick. That's where I always fielded, <laughs> ironically. <laughs> Consequently, the <laughs> 1934 Australian tour to England featured no body line bowling and relations between the two teams quickly healed. On that tour, Bradman was battling health issues with muscle spasms, a back problem, and suffering from periodic abdominal pains. 
Despite this, he still managed to score an innings of 304 and one of 244 in the final test to help Australia regain the Ashes. The severe abdominal pains turned out to be an infected appendix. He was operated on and the following day got peritonitis. Apparently, he was so close to death that his wife immediately set off uh, to England on the four-week ship journey. Wouldn't that be shattering? (laughs) Oh, your husband's about to die. All right, I'll rush over. Just see you in four weeks. Fuck. Uh, Weeks into her journey, she finally got the news that he'd pulled through, though. Once she arrived, they headed to France for Christmas. That's nice. Oh, that's nice. Uh, By now, the Bradmans had relocated from Sydney to Adelaide and he'd started working for a stockbroker named Harry Hodgett. Bit of fun. He moved from Sydney to Adelaide. And he has a day job? Yes. I mean, they only got paid 40 bucks a week, didn't they? He's the best in the fucking world. He's the Babe Ruth. And he moves to Adelaide (laughs) and has a job to be a... Well, he was working for a stockbroker. Yeah, Is that right? I think he moved to Adelaide in part. I feel like it was maybe to get away from, like, he didn't love the celebrity stuff as much. So maybe he wanted to go to a, a, a slightly smaller city. He was also, he was a country yeah, boy. Yeah, a as city well. where fuck all happens. I love Adelaide. <laughs> Adelaide's nice. Adelaide doesn't like me now. <laughs> Um, but I don't care. Fuck you, Adelaide. Yeah, I, I don't know 100%, but I, I know that he, yeah, he, he considered actually playing in England professionally for cricket and making, I think he would get paid £500 a season over there. And he strongly considered that, even though that would mean he wouldn't be allowed to play test cricket anymore because of old school rules. Uh, um, but then a few businesses in Australia came together and said, hey, we'll set you up with some jobs and we'll look after, we'll get you some um writing work and different bits and pieces to help um, get you a better living wage or even, you know, like maybe getting paid what you're worth almost. But anyway, yeah, he, That's he, he chose to move to Adelaide, get in a stockbroking. Things were going pretty smoothly off the field. What an anti-climax. <laughs> I'm going to move to Adelaide, work for a stockbroker. <laughs> I'm the best in the world at Yeah, something. like it's still peaking as well. And I live in Adelaide. <laughs> Like that time, am I going too hard at Adelaide? You let me know. Like that time, Ben Folds lived in Adelaide for a while. He was the best at the world. Oh, yeah, in sort of being Ben s- Folds, somber piano, pop, rock, keyboards, and he. He was the best in the world, and arguably still is at Ben Folds yeah, music. Yeah, he's top five. I'd say he's in my t- Ben Folds five. <laughs> um, yeah, right. That's so fair. things were going pretty smoothly off the field, but things could be a little bit icy on it uh, and in the change rooms. Some of his Australian teammates through his career are said to have not loved playing with him. This has been explained in different ways. Some say other players didn't like living in his shadow. Others say he was very aloof and didn't socialise much with his teammates. Someone had an example of when he hit his big uh, 334 in England, an Aussie businessman over there wrote him a cheque for a £1,000 and said, well done, mate, go have some fun or whatever. And he didn't share it with his teammates and someone said that was one of the reasons why that um, that sort of was an example of why he wasn't that good to his teammates, which I found interesting. I mean, why? What'd they do? What'd they do for the thousand pounds? Well, I guess he needs someone batting at the other end. If someone gives me a cheque for a thousand pounds, am I supposed to share it with you? According to some. I wouldn't think okay, so. Okay, well, no, because it's my thousand pounds. <laughs> Depends on what you did it for. If it was someone said, geez, you were so good on that podcast, <laughs> here's a thousand pounds, I'd be like, well, she was, and she deserved every penny. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she buys herself something very nice. Because <laughs> I, lo- I love her when I she's happy. When she's happy. Oh, I love to see her happy. I'm happy when she's happy. <laughs> um, an example of the unease between Bradman and his teammates occurred after he stayed home from the 1935-36 tour of South Africa. The bradman side had a successful tour of South Africa and senior players like Bill O'Reilly made not-so-subtle comments about how they love playing under the captaincy of Vic Richardson as opposed to Bradman. According to Wiki, a clique of players who were openly hostile towards Bradman formed during the tour. For some, the prospect of playing under Bradman was daunting, as was the knowledge that he would be sitting in judgment of their abilities in his role as a selector. So at this stage, he was both the star player... But he was also a team selector. Um, To start the new season, the test side played a rest of Australia team, captained by Bradman. So this is the Australian team playing a rest, best of the rest, which unfortunately for them included Bradman. 
because he wasn't in the team at the time. And uh, Bradman captained the best of the rest team. Uh, it was played in Sydney in October 1936. The Test eleven suffered a big defeat due to Bradman's 212 and a bag of 12 wickets by leg spinner Frank Ward. Rather undiplomatically, Bradman let the members of the test team know that despite their recent success, they were not quite as good as they believed themselves to be. So, you know. Oh, so it maybe wasn't, yeah, it's interesting. Because a lot of the quotes he does are so, like, polite and sportsmanlike, but then you hear little things like that and you go, oh, he was. And I also think, that, is there something in it where to be absolutely dominant, you have to be a bit of an arsehole? I don't know if that's true, but it feels maybe like it is. Absolutely, yes. There has to be like that killer instinct in you. I think you would find that most elite sports people have an element of asshole in them. Yeah, right. Especially individual sports like tennis and stuff like that. They're, I'm sure like they're nice people, but they've got to have just that little bit of asshole. Yeah, you've got to be them. somewhat selfish, right? Yeah, for sure. In like within that context of your sport, yeah. sure. Uh, but yeah, that's a it's a bit of a shame that if that is the case. But also, like, if the, if it was just the fact that he didn't socialize that much with them, he was kind of aloof and maybe kept to himself. I mean, he obviously didn't like the the celebrity or the touring or anything like that. So, I mean, why do you dislike him just because of his personality? Yeah, it did sound like people like he they'd have a win and he he'd um, rather than go have a drink, he'd go back to his room and play music on his gramophone or something that sounds way better like that's more what i that's what i do after shows yes yeah. did he did he go back to his room wheeled out the water tank got the stump and the golf ball and just <laughs> hit it against there for about six yeah. hours i think that's that sounds about right to me so in this report believe it or not i skip over a bunch of his on-field achievements I uh, figured it would get pretty tedious if i went through every <laughs> century he made he made a lot of them uh but you know he was very good in most games he played. Yep, I believe uh, Funnily enough, it wasn't just on the cricket field he dominated. He played a bit of squash to keep fit, which is like um, racquetball, I guess. Mm. And uh, in 1937, he won the South Australian Squash Championship. He just what? took it up to stay fit. <laughs> he ended up being, winning the state championship. Amazing. That's wow. amazing. So he became the Don Bradman of <laughs> was squash. The Don <laughs> in South Australia, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, back to cricket. On the 1938 tour of England, Bradman scored more centuries, helping the Aussies retain the Ashes. And there was a point where I was going to go through every series because there wasn't there wasn't that many. And I'll go. And in the first test, he got this and he got. But oh yeah, I God. thought that might have got a bit tedious. Uh, off the field, Bradman wasn't too happy with the Australian board, though. This is from uh, Michael Page's bio again. I found this kind of interesting. What an old school rule. It's almost like this was. 80 years ago, Bradman called his team together to discuss a clause in their contracts that forbade their wives, children, or other family members from being in England while the tour was in progress. They weren't allowed in the whole country. What? Uh, Bradman simply wanted the board to allow his wife to join him at the end of the tour. He's like, there's a rule that says she can't come over and be in the country and then meet me at the end of the tour. Is there any chance we can break this rule? The board subsequently refused his request and he was so angry that he drafted a letter of resignation from Australian cricket. But he was talked out of delivering it by the team doctor, Rowley Pope. All he would say publicly was that he was extremely disappointed. The board eventually relented under pressure from the other Australian players. No, that just seems so strange. That's so weird. You'll be distracted even if she's six hours drive away. Why? What? <laughs> Why? Why? Why would I be? Yeah, or even just like in the same city, just in a, a different hotel. Or why not even but at the same hotel? But when that tour was over, yeah, why not in the same yeah. room? That sounds like someone from the board wanted to have an affair every time <laughs> yeah. they went to England. Uh, no wives. No wives. Yeah. No no we're all, we all agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> boys only, boys trip. <laughs> Plus my mistress. <laughs> yeah, only wives. I said wives. I didn't say wives. No wives. <laughs> Secret second families, yes. <laughs> of course. No legitimate children, okay? We okay with that? We put legitimate in there in the contract? When war broke out in 1939, this is something I didn't consider either. The world Second World War happened right in the middle of when he was smashing it. Uh, when war broke out in 1939, the decision was made to keep cricket going in Australia for morale and Bradman kept banging out tons. This is at state level. But according to Page, when France surrendered on the 25th of June, 
Bradman was among thousands of Australians who rushed to enlist. He joined the RAAF, but was uh, seconded to the army where he was made a lieutenant and sent to Victoria to train as a physical training instructor bound for the Middle East. Wait, do we say lieutenant? We say lieutenant, don't we? Yeah. He was made a lieutenant, written lieutenant, or written like something else. It's one of those words. There's, it, it certainly does not have left. There's no F in there. One of those dastardly words. I mean, even as lieutenant, it's bloody a stretch. But lieutenant, take a fucking walk. All right. <laughs> I didn't know that. They should use him like that tennis player yes. we talked about. They should just get get Don over there, give him a bag of grenades and a cricket bat, and he'll <laughs> and fuck some tell shit him, up. Tell him that uh, the Germans are about to ring the bell. <laughs> yeah. I'll say they were they were just um, mocking you <laughs> last week, actually. Right, well, he was saying, oh, yeah, Jerry over there was saying that he, he bowled you out. Is that true? He's been yeah. dining out on Is that, it. He's been telling everyone. That guy over there driving that tank. Uh, he'd already had one kid earlier in the war, and on the 17th of April 1941, his wife Jessie had a second child, Shirley June. Meanwhile, her husband's muscular spasms had spread to his right arm, which he could not raise above his shoulder. He was invalided out of the army and went with his family to Mittagong near Barrel to convalesce. The Bradmans returned to Adelaide in 1942, and Bradman resumed work at Harry Hodgetts the stockbroker. He was playing a little golf, but no cricket. On the 11th of May, 1943, he was elected to the Adelaide Stock Exchange. You know, that was a thing you could do, get elected to the Stock Exchange. But his job disappeared overnight when Hodgetts was declared bankrupt and faced criminal charges. I knew it. That's why you don't go to Adelaide. (laughs) (laughs) Your boss will be a crook. I've heard it time and again. (laughs) Someone says, oh, you wouldn't believe it. My boss is a crook. And I say, you live in Adelaide, don't you? And they say, how did you know? And I said, because every fucking boss in Adelaide is a crook. So he set up his own stockbroking business, Don Bradman & Co. in Adelaide. What? Yeah. What? Don Bradman set up a fucking stockbroker in Adelaide? If it helps you understand, it was sort of like the Don Bradman of stockbroking businesses. Oh. Wow. Okay, that doesn't make sense yet. Is that what it said on the poster? <laughs> uh, by 1945, he had not handled a cricket bat for five years. He just hadn't picked one up. Wow. And his muscular problem now affected both arms. Obviously not good for someone who wants to play cricket. While mm-hmm. an Australian side toured New Zealand during the winter of 1946, he built up his health with the help of Melbourne masseur, Ern Saunders. Bradman was ambivalent about playing cricket again, but with his wife taking a greater role in the business, he accepted the Australian captaincy against England's 1946 touring team. Oh, I don't know if I want to play. All right, I'll be the Australian captain. Uh, and believe it or not, he kept smashing out runs. You don't the say. The way his body was failing him, though, it was expected his retirement was imminent. But he forged on so that he could play in the first Australian Test Series against India. In that series, as a 39-year-old, he made four big centuries. 39 is very old for cricket, right, Dave? You nearly know. I don't remember yeah. any Australian cricketers in my lifetime playing that up to that age. No, it's really old, yeah. Uh, this set the stage for his final ever test series, the 1948 Ashes in England. I, that was cool. I, I Just by the by, I just sort of breezed over that, but Australia first played India there in, in the late um, 40s. That's kind of cool because they're one of the powerhouses of cricket now. It's interesting that we've oh, only yeah. got like a 70-year history of playing them. So final ever test series, 1948, Ashes in England. England hadn't won the urn since the controversial Bodyline series 15 years earlier, though the teams hadn't played since 1938 due to the breakout of the Second World War. Since the resumption of test cricket after the war, the Australians were undefeated and started the series' strong favourites. Bradman was captain and he publicly stated his side had the lofty ambition of going through the whole tour without being defeated. I love that sort of the public setting of expectations as impossibly yeah. high. Yeah, love that. Uh, but anyway, this is what they did. They were unbeaten through all of their tour matches and the five test series, beating England 4-0 with the third test ending in a draw due to rain delays. Bradman walked out for his final test innings at 5.50pm on Saturday, August 14, 1948, at the Oval Cricket Ground in London. There were 40 minutes of play left in the day. The following is from an article written by Dan 
Collar Simone of the ABC earlier this year, and it sums it up pretty good. So a lot of people listening might not know anything about Bradman, and if they don't, they don't know about this. But this is, this is one of his most famous innings for all the wrong reasons. Don came into bat <laughs> facing Eric Hollies, the leg spin bowler, says legendary Australian all-rounder Neil Harvey. At 19, he was 20 years younger than his hero, playing in just his second test. He sat in the pavilion waiting to bat, watching it unfold. The reception he got when he went out to bat at the Oval from the England team and the public, because the ground was packed, absolutely packed, the English players all got around him when he came into bat. All took their caps off and gave him his three cheers. And you can't tell me that that doesn't affect somebody. And I don't think Don would be immune from that. I mean, we heard earlier that he was pretty much immune from that, but uh, Neil Harvey suggested maybe he wasn't. Maybe that might have got to him, the emotion of it all. The English players were gracious, but not about to go easy on the figure who had menaced them for four tours and two decades. We'll give him three cheers when he gets on the square, but that's all we'll give him. Then bowl him out, England captain Norman Yardley told his team. The English people loved him, and he loved them back, says Harvey. He really wasn't expected to go on the tour, but he felt he owed it to the English public. He had health problems, fibrositis and such. He didn't want the English people to be let down, and because they'd been suffering so much during the war, he felt compelled to go. That's the reason he went. So it's something I didn't really realise. I didn't realise this happened when he was so old and also mm. that he, his body was failing him by this point as well. And it's interesting that he was like, felt a duty to the English supporters. They supported him so well that he wanted to give them one last tour. That's uh, nice. The English adored him right till the finish. At 39 years of age, he went to England in 1948 and captained this great Invincibles team and he still made two centuries. That's not too bad for 39, is it? This would be Bradman's <laughs> final knock. That was almost assured when he strode out for the fifth test of the Ashes series with Australia on one for 117 and looking to complete an unbeaten tour. England had been dismissed for 52, the whole team, in its first innings, meaning the Australians would not have to bat again. He walked to the wicket in front of a crowd of 20,000, having scored 6,996 test runs and lost his wicket 69 times. So at that point, his average, nice. yeah, a nice amount of times. <laughs> so he'd, um, his average at that point was over 100. It was 101.39. If he was able wow. to be dismissed for a 70th time, he needed just four more runs to reach 7,000 and end his career with an average of 100. But nobody knew that. In those days, statistics were nothing, Harvey says. Nobody had a clue. The press didn't know. There was no television, of course. And if the press didn't know, nobody's going to know. So that's how it was. We just played the game as a normal session. That's interesting. I assumed everyone was like, he needs at least four runs to get 100. Yeah, because these days you'd be counting down going, oh, three to go, two to go. He only needs one here. And he's Yeah, there'd be a graphic that already have like memorabilia for sale. Yeah. 100 plus (laughs) average. Uh, In the BBC radio coverage, Rex Alston handed over to his junior commentator, John Arlett, as Bradman walked out to bat. And he's great. I really like his commentary, so I'm going to read some of that here. The crowd settles down again. They've got 40 minutes left to play and Bradman is now taking guard. Hollies is going to bowl and John Arlett shall describe the first bowl. So come in, John. I love uh, cricket radio. They they really, it's everything that's going on. And here is what commentator John Arlett said from there. He bowls. Bradman goes back across his wicket, pushes the ball gently in the direction of the Houses of Parliament, which are out beyond mid-off. It doesn't go as far as that. Merely goes to Watkins at silly mid-off. No run. Still 117 for one. That is funny cricket comedy. (laughs) I mean, you guys are laughing, but that's good stuff. That is almost the same as when a principal Skinner punishes Bart by taking him out with a telescope to look at stars, and he's like, 98 degrees (laughs) north, 30 degrees south, 4.36 a.m. Left. No sighting. Left dimension. (laughs) Yeah, I I can't remember what the language was, but yeah, that was funny. So that's also that is no run. <laughs> the ball goes in the direction of the Houses of Parliament, which are out beyond mid-off. It doesn't go as far as that. It merely goes to Watkins. I mean, Watkins is the perfect player name as well for an English cricket team in the 1940s. Anyway, it goes on. Two slips, a silly mid-off, and a forward short leg close to him as Hollies pitches the ball up slowly, and he's bowled. Bradman bowled Hollies, naught. And what do you say under these circumstances? 
I wonder if you see the ball very clearly in your last test in England, on a ground where you've played some of the biggest cricket of your life and where the opposing side has just stood around you and given you three cheers and the crowd has clapped you all the way to the wicket. I wonder if you see the ball at all. He's sort of giving him excuses, I guess. <laughs> oh, the humanity. <laughs> Two balls and the innings was over. So Don's <gasps> career was done. Harvey says the complete silence around the ground also reached into the Australian dressing room. I'm sure that emotion was one of the main reasons why he didn't pick a wrong and from Holly's. Got an inside edge onto the stumps and that was it. I was padded up, ready to go in, and he walked in and sat down beside me and said, Fancy doing a thing like that. That's <laughs> 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 uh, such a great understated thing. Apparently, we, um, others have said, you know, he was... He was disappointed. He wanted to. He wanted to, you know, go out with a big score and show the English he appreciated them by beating them again. <laughs> Cola Simone goes on in this ABC article saying, "Holly's had no time for sentimentality. Best fucking ball I've bowled all season, and they're clapping him." <laughs> he said to his teammates. <laughs> Apparently, the story of how uh, that ball came to be bowled is pretty great as well. He. He played in a, a tour match uh, a few months earlier. He the, the two played against him and he, he bowled to him and he realised that Bradman, he did, he's like, I don't think he's picking up my wrong one. And a wrong one for the leg spinner is the one that basically um, spins the other way, Bob. Instead of spinning out to the right-hander, it, it spins into the wicket. Right. Uh, and he's like, I don't think he's picking it. So in the second innings of that match, he didn't bowl any wrong ones to him going, in case I play him in a test match, I won't give him any siders now. I'll save it for the test match. And that's what that's when he bowled it. So wow. in his mind, he the plan just all came together. That bowler also had to be talked into playing that game. He was going to play for his county cricket side. He's like, it's a dead rubber. They've already beaten us. They've already won the series. It doesn't mean anything. I don't want to play. And, and he got talked into it. And then was the guy who broke Bradman's heart in the last innings. Wow. Uh, Bradman's batting partner, Arthur Morris, watched the historic moment from the other end of the pitch, 22 yards away. His contribution would also be outshone by Brad Bradman's famous failure. He would tell the story in the decades to come. I often say to people, yes, I was there. I'm asked, were you playing? I reply, yes, I got 196. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were there, were you? Oh, yeah. Were you? Did you play that day? I've never even heard of that guy. Well, he got a, he got 196 that day. Oh, and no, I've heard of Arthur Morris. He's a, I think he's another legend. All right, I've heard of him. I'll give him that. Uh, so Bradman's duck left his career test average at 99.94, a number no one has got anywhere near since. With a minimum of 20 career innings, the next closest only make the low 60s. So it's a huge gap. Yeah, wow. Does it really, but... really annoy you, Bob? Yes, I was going to say, that pisses me off. It was so close. He hit one four and he would have finished with the perfect average of 100. It would have been amazing. I think this, I mean, it kind of makes it more iconic. Yeah. There's something, you know, a little bit of tragedy at the end of this um, heroic career. So it was. That adds a bit of something to it. It was 99 point what? Nine four. Just so I remember for future trivia. Yeah, well, good. Oh, well, here's a fun fact. Uh, well. That relates to you. Well, okay. Here's, Here's a, a fact. fact. <laughs> but it does relate to your other employer. Oh, yeah. The Australian Broadcasting Corporation takes its postcode of 9994 from Bradman's career average. Takes its postcode? Yeah. So if you send mail to the ABC, the postcode is 9994. Huh. That's I mean, cool. I don't have to send mail to the ABC. That's You probably cool. get your, your checks from them though, right? Yes. And they send it to me. <laughs> Uh, and I'm one 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 because I'm number one. Oh wow, that's actually 111. But shut the fuck up. They might have told you. Shut you the fuck, fuck up. <laughs> so Bradman's final test innings was a failure, but his final Australian tour was not. In all, the side went through their 34 match tour undefeated. 34 match tour. What? Wow. And they would become known as the Invincibles. As well as Bradman, this legendary team also featured greats like Sid Barnes, Arthur Morris, Keith Miller and Ray Lindwall. It was also the first Ashes series for Harvey, who got his first chance in the fourth test, making 112 and being at that point the youngest Australian 
to make a test 100. <laughs> I think that's right. Cool. Uh, he's also the only member of the Invincibles still alive, the others having all died, making a mockery of the name. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, <laughs> Did you have the same look on your face when you wrote that down? I'm like, I've got to squeeze one joke into this report. <laughs> uh, Harvey made it over for the Ashes test at Lords in England last year in 2019, and he told the ABC, it's my favourite ground. I've realised it's the home of cricket, and I appreciate all that history of the place it's got, and I just love going back there. And uh, this next line is the only reason I included this paragraph in here. Every time I walk through those grace gates, I get turned on. There's no doubt about it. It does something to me. Oh, I want to fuck it. Hot? I want to fuck it. <laughs> I want to fuck that ground. <laughs> I'm invincible. Fuck me, ground. I'm, I don't fuck humans. I I'm walk, invincible. I walk through those gates and I've got a massive boner immediately. <laughs> and I'm ready to fuck. Okay, thanks. Okay, Neil, thanks, thanks for Neil. Sure. I'm probably not going to publish that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did. <laughs> they published the truth at the ABC. Turns me on. I get randy for it. All right, okay. <laughs> Please stop. Uh, the ABC article goes on. Every Australian player on that 1948 tour wanted to share the crease with Donald Bradman. Harvey only got a couple of opportunities to do so, but said batting with the Dom was like living the dream. It was just a pleasure to get up at the other end and watch him. He was twice as good as anybody else, Harvey said. If you can't get out there and watch and learn something, well, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> he was a joy to watch and a great bloke to get on with, which obviously is a, a different perspective than what others had. Cool to know that Neil really, Neil Harvey really enjoyed playing with him. Uh, the following year, 1949, Bradman was knighted for services to cricket. He's still the only Australian test cricketer to receive that honour. I think he's the only stockbroker as well. Yes. <laughs> he got, yeah, he's got two knighthoods. I don't even know you could get that. But Again, he's a double knight. He's a knight. double knight. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, only Australian cricketer ever received that honour. Bill Woodfull, who you would have remember from earlier, he was the captain during the Bodyline series. He was offered the same honour in 1934 just after the Bodyline series but turned it down. I imagine with his finger up going, nah, fuck you, queen, or whatever. I'd take it. Yeah. What am I? What am I, John Lennon? I'd take a knighthood. I'd be a knight. Sir Jessica, I love it. Sounds great. I'd take that for sure. That just works. Thank you. Uh, modern great Sachin Tendulkar is the player some argue eclipse Bradman. Cricket.com recounted the time Tendulkar visited the Don. He asked Bradman how he thought he'd have coped in the contemporary game. He said that he didn't think he would have scored quite so many runs because of the more defensive field settings that are used nowadays, Tendulkar wrote. Uh, he also said that the standard of fielding was much better in the contemporary game. Tendulkar and Warren then asked Bradman what his test average would likely have been if he was playing then. Bradman replied, around 70. We were slightly surprised and asked if he was sure it would be so much lower than his famous career average of 99.94, Tendulkar writes. He said, well... 70 isn't bad for a 90-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's another string in Bradman's bow. Wisecracker. I oh, love that. Squash. Cricket. Poetry. Song. Stocks. Stocks. Wisecracking. Yep. Long-time listener, patron, and all-round gentleman, Gary J from the UK, hmm. messaged me to let me know that as well as the knighthood, Bradman has... Received a Companion of the Order of Australia in 1979. Voted the greatest male athlete of the past 200 years by the Australian Confederation of Sport in 1988. Selected as one of only two Australians by international who's who top 100 people who have done the most to shape the 20th century. The other former Australian selected was Rupert Murdoch. Uh, nominated among the top 10 sports people of the 20th century by the World Confederation of Sport. Named Male Athlete of the Century in 1999 by the Sport Australia Hall of Fame. Right. Ranked the number one Australian athlete of the 20th century by Sports Illustrated magazine with a bikini cover. <laughs> Don in a the, bikini, obviously. Don in, yeah. Don in a centre spread. In 2000, he was voted the greatest cricketer of the 20th century by Wisden Cricket Almanac. This decision was unanimous amongst the 100 judges. 
which uh, you can't get much more definitive than that. And he was nominated captain of the Australian cricket team of the century. So a couple of little feats there. Wow. Uh, but I, I wanted to finish with a, a maybe a weirder fact, hopefully fun as well. Let's see what Jeff oh, says. I'm so excited for weird. <laughs> <laughs> What's he into? What's he into? Well, it's not that weird. It's, I mean, it's it's pretty plain for weird, but it is. Well, let's see what you think. He always wore fishnets under <laughs> his cricket pants. <laughs> and that actually uh, meant that he had to wear baggier cricket pants, which inspired <laughs> a lot of other cricketers. <laughs> According to an ABC article, Sir Donald was a very careful driver. As he got older, he only wanted to make left turns, so drove in concentric circles. <laughs> <laughs> he just drove around the block. What do you mean, Donald? If you turn left enough times, you'll you'll get there. <laughs> Why did he do that? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Our Don Bradman. I wish that was it. There should be a new verse in the song. Turning left and left again. <laughs> Our Don Bradman. Left and left and left and left. <laughs> Don, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, well, that's a fun fact. Three left and that a brings right. us to the end of the Don Bradman report. Well done. Wow, what, what, a, ma- what a journey. What, what a journey. Epic. What a mammoth report and an end to, uh, you know, it's bittersweet. It's an end to Gary J's 30-plus uh, week-long uh, petitioning for this very topic. So I hope he's happy. Yeah, hope, it's hope funny. I mean, he did actually, he, he there was some time, I, I normally would finish a biography report with um uh, all good things must come to an end. And, of course, all good things must come to an end. There was uh, hope that he would finally make the 100 in life when he wasn't able to do that with his average. Oh, no. But um, no, he no, died. But he, again, he died at the age of 99.94. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. If he was alive for six more hours, <laughs> he would have made it. He No, he died in February of 2001, aged 92. So he died... In a pre nine eleven world. Wow. <laughs> Ninety two. That's a fucking good inning. Eh? Yeah. He only knew how to score big. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, that does bring us to the end of the episode. Should we get into everyone's favourite section of the show? Um, I reckon. Okay. Well, I think it's got a little jingle. It's called Fact Quote or Question. The jingle Fact, goes. Fact Quote or Question. Ding. Oh, he always remembers the ding. So the way this one works is if you support us at patreon.com slash pod on the Sydney Scheinberg Deluxe Memorial Edition level, rest in peace, uh, you get to give us a fact, a quote, or a question. There's a heap of different rewards that you can get involved on and different prices, different levels. Bonus episodes, we now do three bonus episodes a month. Dave's in charge of those this month. He's already That's done right. a mini report. Yeah, we uh, I did a report which was inspired by our episode a couple of weeks ago. I talked about uh, the Bat Bomb and other weird World War II explosives inspired Another by Another nickname of Don Bradman. Oh, the Bat Bomb. Uh, yes, yeah, so that was inspired by us talking very briefly about anti-tank dogs. And we also talked about a few <laughs> other animals that they tried to blow up in World War II to kill the enemy. And it was very, very strange story. Truly yeah. stupid. Uh, and, yeah, so there's, there's heaps of other things. There's the Facebook group, which is if you're in there, you would have seen this Don Bradman campaign that's been going on for... The best part of a year. Um, but, yes, for this section, uh, it's the fact, quote, or question section. First up from Bron Alde, uh, and in brackets, yes, you can thank me all day. Correct pronunciation. Oh, Bron all day. Thank you, Bron. <laughs> oh, no, we always say all day until then, that one moment. <laughs> uh, and Bron has given herself the title of Do Go On Quiz Team Scribe. I seldom know the answer but have excellent penmanship. So Love there's that. A, on the Facebook Patreon group, there's a weekly quiz put up by Thomas, and he, uh, yeah, obviously Bron is the scribe. So that's another fun little thing you can get involved in if you want to. That's not even an official, that's not even an official uh, reward or whatever you call it, but that's just a 
freaking sweet bonus. Whenever I'm in there, I'm like, uh, smarter people are handling this. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave them to it. I'll, I'll leave them to it. I often come in late and go, I don't know any of these. Oh, they've already <laughs> figured it out. Cool. <laughs> I'll slink away. I'll go back out, hit, hit a ball against the tank. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Braun has asked us a question this week, and the question is, my favourite dinosaur is a brontosaurus because it has my name in it. Fair. If you were a dinosaur, what sort of dinosaur would you be? Ooh. Davosaurus. Yeah. Well, you'd be Daftosaurus if you're using the same the same um, <laughs> formula. Okay. <laughs> so I couldn't help you because I didn't know where you were going. I'd be Matosaurus. I what's my f- I think my favorite. I think it maybe is even Hack my favorite. T Rex. Dinosaur. Triceratops. Oh, Hack. Triceratops. Triceratops. Yeah. I'd be a flying one. Oh yeah, pterodactyl. Yeah, I'd be a pterodactyl. I love to fly. Wow, Actually, that's, that's cool. not true. I don't like being on planes. They scare me. But if I could fly. But if you were a plane. Yeah, because I different. like to be in control. So if I if I was some sort of creature that could fly, I'm in control of that. Then I feel comfortable. You're both so, the plane and the pilot. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like driving on like like acid. the Great Ocean Road. <laughs> I love driving on acid. But I love driving the Great Ocean Road on acid. If I'm like with friends... <laughs> Uh, driving along the Great Ocean Road, I have to drive because I have to be in control. Yeah, otherwise you get sick in your tummy. Uh, sure. <laughs> what I say like that. It's really that. just more a control freak thing. Right. I know people who don't like those windy roads unless they're in control of the vehicle just because it makes them feel car sick. Yeah, get less car sick. Sure, it's that. That's just a good way of you getting out of looking like a control freak next time. Yeah, perfect. That's a little life hack. <laughs> so, yeah, can I be a Triceratops? I'm going to be uh, those little ones that fuck up Newman in Jurassic Park. Yeah, yeah, They spit gack? Is that them? Yeah, that was... The raptors, was it? They're raptors, but I've been told by someone who's a dinosaur enthusiast, but that's not what raptors actually are. But I could be wrong. Oh, no. No, I'm not... You know those little ones? Yeah. Like also also Are they also called raptors? Yeah. So velociraptors are different. Uh, well, I mean, you are talking to a couple of dino spurts, so I think just take our answer for it. Yeah, just put me down for one of those. But I'm pretty sure, no, don't listen to me and don't at me. Thank you so much, Bron. Hopefully you also, I mean, Bronosaurus is a great too. I love those ones that are kind of like dinosaur giraffes with the long necks. Yeah, they're cool. They're cool. And I think of Bronosaurus is in that sort of family. Dinosaur giraffes. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Bron. The next one comes from Jordan Jonder Nassi. And Jordan's given himself the title of Dave's Sugar Bowl Expert and Union Rep. <laughs> Remember and when up... Dave didn't know what a sugar bowl was? <laughs> Still don't. <laughs> That's fun. Oh, and if you want to see that happen in real time, you can now uh, get a ticket to that episode. Um, that first series of live streams uh, was only up at the time. You could get a ticket and only it was only up for 24 hours. But Stupid Old Studios have got it up in their new system now so you can buy a ticket and have it for as long as you like and see Dave, his, see, his, see his face as he is confused by sugar bowls. <laughs> Enjoy that and vision. You can go to uh, sospresents.com. And if you did buy a ticket back then, you should have got an email explaining to you how to access those again. Yep. Uh, anyway, Jordan... A.K.A. Dave Sugar Bowl expert and the union rep has a fact, and the fact looks longish. Let me read it. I have a few facts about Canada. Canadian hero and future report topic Terry Fox ran 5,373 kilometres on one leg, raising over $25 million for cancer research. I mean, Jordan, it feels like we don't need to do a report now. You've yeah, just you've sum- done it. You've done it for us. Uh, my hometown, Calgary, go Flames, Alberta, hosts the world's largest stampede has been doing so since 1912. That's on my list of things to do. Yeah. One, one of my friends went a couple of years ago. I met some Calgarians when I was traveling through the Greek islands uh, many moons ago, 10 years ago or something now actually, and, yeah, got on really well with them. And I've been meaning to go visit a Calgary stampede, but just never got around to it. But that's why I go for the flames. And ah. the, the penguins is a different story. It's because I was given a hat. <laughs> so I have two hockey teams. Um, we have six time zones in Canada. Fun fact. Wait, just that a fun fact? 
That's pretty fun. Uh, we call beanies toques or toques. Toques, yeah. They always, toque? Yeah. On, on Nathan for you, he's always talking about his toque. Uh, the coldest temperature ever recorded in Canada is negative 63 degrees Celsius. That's cold. That's too cold. Uh, Calgary is famous for its Chinooks, a weather phenomenon that can raise the temperature by 10 degrees in a matter of minutes. The Oof. baseball glove was invented in Canada in 1883. <laughs> the CN Tower in Toronto was the world's tallest freestanding structure until 2007. Huh. World's tallest freestanding structure. That's fun. Whatever it means. <laughs> a Canadian delicacy called poutine is made up of fries, gravy, and cheese curds. Yep. I've seen that around. I'm writing this on Canada Day, July 1st. Oh, we're not too delayed on that. About six weeks. All right, final question. Have these facts been sufficiently fun, Jess? I They're guess... pretty fun. I've been thinking for a while now about how many time zones we have. Is it like four? I know of three. Western Australia, South Australia slash Northern Territory, Central no, th- Time, oh, and Eastern sa- Time. Are South Australia and Northern Territory the same? Yeah. They're half an hour behind us. Yeah. And Western Australia is two hours behind us. And then it does get complicated when daylight savings happens because Queensland doesn't do it. So that sort of splits us into four. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, three. Half of Canada. That's crazy. Those are some fun facts. That is a lot. Do you know that China has one? Yeah. I love that. Just consolidate. It won't make sense for everyone, but it makes sense for some of them. I know. What are they doing? Some cities, it's like, this is perfect. Some of them, some of the cities must be like, oh, it's uh, it's dark at midday. <laughs> China's a big country. Do you know that about China? Huge. Yeah, it's real big. Is it the, Dave, would it be the, it's top five. I know that. Australia's five. Um... Brazil's four. China, Russia, and no, Canada, no, USA. Also, and no. Russia, yeah. Mm. Fun fact. Jess, was that fun? <laughs> um, you rambling through it? I'm <laughs> <laughs> going, wait, no, yes, wait. I still don't think what I said was quite <laughs> right. But anyway, uh, Catherine Klo, uh is chief optimist. What a fantastic person to have on board. Thank you, Catherine, for bringing the optimism. And a question this week which is what is your ultimate dinner party slash barbecue slash picnic slash brunch of six with no regard to time or space, life or death, and obviously all catering, venue expense, and so on is taken care of naturally. What do you mean? It's Those are all so different. Yeah, I dinner guess. Dinner party, barbecue, picnic. Are we doing all of them or no, I think picking you're just, one? You're picking one. Okay. What's your ultimate? Uh, I mean, pick- is this for all of us together? Maybe we each bring two guests. No, one guest because it's six. We each get to bring one guest. Uh, Jess, you handle location. Dave, food. And I'll bring decorations. No, music. Okay. Yeah, great. Decorations. <laughs> Are you going to fucking bring party hats? <laughs> food, food wise, it's just cheese. Oh, just yeah. Just cheese. Big spread. Nothing else. Not even biscuits or bread. Just <laughs> cheese. So you some cheese is sort of like the bit plays as the biscuit. And then you yeah. put a piece of cheese on top of that cheese and on then cheese. you dip it in like a soft cheese. Mm, fondue. Dave, yep. that sounds terrible. No, no. Why are you doing it? could be anything and you've chosen just cheese. I'm Not regretting... even a nice grazing plate or anything. Yeah. yeah, there's a plate. This is ultimate. You're a fucking idiot. Just cheese. Can we take him out of the equation? Let's yeah. bring two friends each. <laughs> <laughs> Did I miss a bit? Why are we bringing friends? What's that? Uh, it's what she said. It's your ultimate dinner party, blah, 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 of six. Oh. And there's three of us. I'm going to replace my friend with a block of cheese. <laughs> no, you're not invited anymore. Are you not taking this seriously? Because Catherine's been waiting for this answer. Seriously. No, I'm taking it very seriously. So seriously that if you don't agree to this, you will both die. So we can't even put the cheese on a cracker. No. Or on some bread. There's no room for the bread. Is there quince paste? No. What the fuck? It's just fucking cheese. Like, but every type of cheese. Name a cheese, it's there. <laughs> I, li- I do <laughs> like I like some cheese. Is there a Me smoky too. cheddar? I like the monobiki. <laughs> mm, sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. There's a smoky cheddar. Yep. Oh I'd love some sun-dried God. tomatoes and olives as well. I'm afraid no room. Why the fuck did you put Dave in charge I, of this? I will never make this mistake again. <laughs> 
Putting I really thought he would have brought something cool to the party, but oh. I have cheese, lots of it, like <laughs> heaps so, of it. I'm mad about this now. I don't know why. I just want it to be cheese. It's my dream. <sighs> All right. Um. I'm now, Jess. Who can we bring who will have food with them? I'm gonna bring. <laughs> Um, I'm going to bring Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> yep. I'm going to bring Mr. Biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Biscuits. Mr. Biscuits always comes prepared. He's always got the goose. So, yeah, I'm bringing Mr. Mr. Biscuits and uh, the music's going to be um, fo- or Foxtrot mu- music. Yeah. About Don Bradman. Our favourite. Yeah, yeah, our favourite. Oh, Don Bradman. I wish Dave didn't fuck this up. Yeah, Dave really This was going to be a fun it. mind project and he <laughs> fucked it. Well, how is this fucked up? You get to do it's whatever so you want. It's so disrespectful. I picked it. It's not disrespectful. I picked whatever, dis- what I wanted. But you won't even let us have bickies. Yeah, well, I'm afraid how, that wh- I What would that do for you? Allowing us to have bickies. Sorry, you'll have to sneak to the toilets if you want bickies. <laughs> well, I think we will be with a purely cheese diet. We'll be sneaking <laughs> to the toilets quite a lot. <laughs> or never again. One of the two. <laughs> yeah, it's a real roll of the dice. <laughs> oh. I mean, I, I never like go anyway. Gentleman much. doesn't go to the toilet. Yes, I could have picked eggs, but I didn't. Well, yeah, all right. I do prefer cheese over eggs. Fuck me. What were you gonna? you pre- What's the location, Jess? Oh, you should do it in a cracker factory. Oh, okay. Because what? Here's what I was originally thinking, and I don't even remember which city we were in. So try to follow me here. Um, it might have been Bristol. Where was the one that we were staying on top of the the? Bar that was very noisy. Uh, yeah, Bristol. Bristol. First time. And we went, we ha- we found that cafe across the road, which was like used to be a bank and the building was gorgeous and it was really nice inside. Do you remember that? Yeah. And it ended up being a chain. Yeah. And then we had it again another time. I was going to say there because it was really nice, but then Dave ruined it by only bringing cheese. So, yeah, I guess we'll move it to a biscuit factory. But if you have it there, we can just order other things. Have it there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dave can sit there with his weird pile of cheese. I'm excited. I'm to order a meal. I just don't understand why you guys won't get on board with the cheese. I'm on board with cheese. Let's <laughs> get on board. If it's accompanied by other things. I think that ruins the cheese. <laughs> don't dilute the cheese, Jess. <laughs> yeah, come on, now, mate. Can you please move on to the next fact question? Because yes. I'm going to lose. Okay. <laughs> you, look, you seem upset and with good reason. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for that great question. I hopefully, luckily, she is an optimist, so you'll be able to find something in that. Uh, and finally, this week from Michael Derizzi, pronounced. Oh my god, <laughs> he's given us the pronunciation, but with those squiggly lines, I don't know what they mean. What are squiggly lines over the e's, Derizzi? <laughs> uh, anyway, Michael has given himself the title of official one half. Neapolitan Italian of the pod, sucked in Matt. I love I love uh, three flavour ice cream. That's great. <laughs> oh, what's your favourite of the three? Chocolate. Okay. Then vanilla, then strawberry. You can have all the chocolate. As a child, I went the other way. I was a I was a fool when I was a boy. Strawberry, <laughs> vanilla, then chocolate. Idiot. But Jess, you don't like chocolate ice cream? I don't like that chocolate ice cream. Yeah, I mean all oh. of those are bad. It's the worst vanilla, yeah, worst strawberry, worst bad. chocolate. If you could combine Three different types of yeah. good, though. Then I take good. chocolate, vanilla, oh. strawberry. Yep, agreed. Uh, Michael has asked the question: Have you guys seen Avatar: The Last Airbender? That's a no Is for that me. The question? That's the question. He goes on to say some more stuff, but I've just seen. That's a big. That's a no for me, dog. That's a no for it's me. It's a no also. for me too. Uh, he goes on to say, and do you guys agree that it's the best? Yes, I agree. That's a no from me. Oh, also. That's a no for me, dog. <laughs> Dave, you, you know what? You and I are fighting. We both just said no. Yeah, but first the cheese thing. What are you laughing at, Matt? I'm loving this fight. <laughs> this is fun because it feels sort of real. The cheese thing and now it's a no from me, dog. I'm pretending to be that guy from American Idol. <laughs> <laughs> Which guy? Why? I think his name's Randy. <laughs> his name is Randy. Randy the puppet? <laughs> See on his American Idol? Yeah, he was early on. That's fun. <laughs> well, anyway, um, 
Uh, Michael is seriously mad at himself for not watching this in his childhood and waiting until Corona locked down to binge it. It's so good. It's a little hot tip from Michael. Okay, great. So you can you, I'll give it a go. You can really use the fact quota question for anything. And Michael's done it for a little hot tip there. And we appreciate that, Michael. Thank you, Michael, Catherine, Jordan, and Brian. If you want to get involved, go to patreon.com slash to go on pod. Another thing we like to do is thank a few of our other Patreon supporters. Uh, Jess normally comes up with a little game based on today's episode. What do you reckon this week, Jess? For a second, I forgot what the topic was. Um, could we give them a, a a sport they're the best at, the best in the world at? Yeah, but squash and cricket are taken. Yeah, agreed. Squash in South Australia, that is. So it's a sport that they're the Babe Ruth of. Oh, hang on. Put it in the terms I Honest, understand, Dave. Honestly, David, you are on thin ice, my friend. Uh, it's a sport that they're the Don Bradman of creating jobs of. Okay, great. Does the sport sense? they're the Prime Minister of. Mm, Honestly, that's, Dave, that's, good. that's two strikes, one more strike, and you're out. Like Babe Ruth? Oh, yeah, I guess so. I was thinking like Ooh. working strikes and, you know, job creation. To it, let's do it. I'll go through first from... May I thank from Jarrow in Tyne and Weir, Great Britain, Patrick Ward. Patrick Ward is the best in the world at figure skating. Oh, that's a good one. Figure skating, I like that. Because, I mean, I would be probably on the on the podium for that one as well. So it's good to have you up there with me, Patrick. You and me, two of the best. Is Patrick the Torval and or Dean? Yes, 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 yes. Big time. I'm the Torval, he's the Dean. Love it. Without knowing what that means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Patrick, you figure skater you. I'd also love to thank, from Place Unknown, <gasps> Jordan Roundtree. Do you think he's from the Bermuda Triangle? Or Whoa. they're from the Bermuda Triangle? Oh, could be. Could be for sure. I'm going to assume yes. And I reckon Jordan Roundtree is the Don Bradman of pheasant plucking. Mm, a well-known sport. Yeah. Is he it. far? <laughs> Is Jordan fast or are they are they just are they oh, do Oh, he's on one it? of the fastest pheasant pluckers out there. <laughs> you can't f- 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 pluck a pheasant, pheasant faster. Pluck. Jeez. Almost fell for my own trap there. <laughs> well done, Jordan. Good work there. Uh, these are all live pheasants and they, they're basically going in. He's like a barber for pheasants. They want oh, it. Oh, yeah. that's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stylish. Uh-huh. Plucking. And finally, also from a mysterious location, I'd love to thank Akila Telemasca. I've got the feeling that Akila is the Don Bradman of building sandcastles. Oh, that's a Ooh. real... That's, I, it's but something so impressive for that, about that, people who... Build those huge sand sand sculptures, especially because you're like, this is gonna be gone soon. I reckon, yeah, there's something something about that, you know. It said something about it's like a comment on life rather than uh, contemporary art, it's just temporary art. (laughs) Oh, that was very good. Thank you. I've been working as a poet while we're in ISO just for the cash. I feel like you're the Don Bradman of poetry. Thank you, yes. Um, Dave, do you want to thank some people also? Oh, please. I would like to thank from probably the greatest place in the world, Wabash, Indiana. I would like to thank Oof. Kyle R. Haggerty. Oh, Kyle Haggerty from Wabash. Wabash, Indiana. And Kyle is the Don Bradman of scuba diving. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Kyle's been deeper than anyone's ever been. Yep. And other people have tried and they can't. They can't, can't get it. there. They can't do it. Kyle does it easy. Love your work, Kyle. I would like to thank now from Baton Rouge in Louisiana, Jody Scram. Jody, Jody, Jody Scram. Scram. Uh, she is the world champion, sorry, the Don Bradman. Of tapping people on the opposite shoulder and making them think that you're on the other side of them and then they look over there but you're really on the other side and they go, what, what? Oh. Jody, they've, never been, they've never been beaten. That's really good. 
Also, I mean, I started by actually naming a fucking sport. Which one did you name? <laughs> Which one did you name? <laughs> <laughs> that was so cute. I thought you I said, said figure f- skating. That's not yeah. real. <laughs> Which one did you name? <laughs> figure skating. Anyway. I mean, they're both I just words. wish you guys would fill me in when you're going to do it. Do a joke. Oh. Like, just give me a heads up that you're going to make a joke. Oh, I'm sorry. So I can so I can prepare myself okay, for the joke. No, fair enough. Uh, well, coming up next from Seattle, Washington, Stephanie Perkle is the Don Bradman of cricket. Oh. Sorry, Jess didn't tell you I was going to do a joke one. Just kidding. She's the Don Bradman of breakdancing. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Good on you, Stephanie. You. She Break can do dancing, like the, that's cool. The twist on a head and like the freeze and like the worm, all this, but like yeah. real good. Wearing a helmet, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or is this she like body her, line era? She gets her b boys to spin her on her head. That's oh wow, sick. that's sick. That's so cool. Well done, Stephanie Perk. It's amazing that this run of supporters are all top of their game. It's amazing, isn't it? They're the best in the world at this. Pretty incredible. Is it my turn now too? Yes. Well, I would love to thank. Uh, from South Africa. Is that Gorteng? Yeah, wow, South Africa. This is cool. Beatrix Williams. Beatrix Williams. And Matt, what is Beatrix the world's Don Bradman of? Matt, say pottery. Oh, um, <laughs> sculpture? <gasps> oh, the fucking. You. But the what sculptures are pots. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, get it, Beatrix Potter? Oh. Yeah. I did not get that, but I love it now. I Beatrix is a great name. I like it a lot. Beatrix You're not Williams. the only ones who can make jokes. Is ZA <laughs> the country thing for South Africa? I would not have yeah. guessed that. Great work, everyone concerned. South I Africa get, getting a good mention in the report today. Mm. And um, I would also love to thank, thank you again to Beatrix, I would love to thank from St. John. Is I in Indiana? Yes. Yeah. St. John, Indiana, Kathleen Payonk. Oh, Ooh, that's a ripper. That's Payonk. That's sort of Hall of Fame level great name. Yeah, that's really Kathleen good. Kathleen Payonk. Oh, my God. That's so satisfying to say. Kathleen Payonk. Oh, I feel good about myself. And she's actually the best in the world. She's the Don Bradman of uh, glass blowing. Oh, oh yeah. Wow. Love that. That's Beautiful so good. Stuff. She Blows it into any shape you want. You name a Gorgeous. shape, she can do it. Different colours, Circle. whatever. Easy. <laughs> Square. <laughs> Triangle. No problem. Yeah. Yawn. <gasps> glass bottle. Kathleen Payonk. She can do it. She can do glass bottles. <gasps> and wow. it, Yeah, what's her business? Payonk, Payonk panes, like glass panes. Oh, very good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and finally, I would also love to thank from Livermore, California, Corey Stewart. Oh, cuz. Uh, Corey Stewart is the Don Bradman of skill tester machines. Oh, good one. Can get any plush toy you want. Really? Yeah. That's cool. I reckon that that makes sense because I'm very good at those as well, so I imagine that that's a skill that runs in the family. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That's how families work as, as I understand it. Yeah, I think things run in them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't even know why you're even bringing it up again because that's definitely what happens. Anyway, thank you, Catherine. Catherine, not Catherine. I so I take that back. There is no thanks to Catherine, but I do <laughs> thank Corey and Kathleen and Beatrix and Stephanie and Jody and Kyle and Akila and Jordan and Patrick. Thank you all. That only leaves us with the most luxurious and uh, what's a what's a better word here? Fancy, Fancy pants. Fancy pants. <laughs> Exclusive. <laughs> Exclusive club, the Triptage Club. And this is uh, only accessible if you support us on the shout-out level or above for three straight years. And uh, each week we let in a few members if uh, they've been on for three years. Dave normally comes up with a band to play. Jess has a little hors d'oeuvre and drink. And I have a quick look to see if anyone's on the guest list tonight. Mm-hmm. Well, why are you looking at the music tonight? You're not going to believe it. It's not just one musician tonight. We've got 40,000 musicians all playing the music to Oh, 
Don Bradman. <laughs> 40,000. Anyone who bought a copy of the sheet music will be performing for us tonight. Wow. That's great. Yeah, it's going to sound horrific, but it'll be very fun. Yeah, it'll be really good. Well, to accompany that while you're watching the 40,000 horrific musicians, um, we'll just have a selection of cheese. <laughs> My dream. And just fucking cheese. I love, thank you so much for catering and to us cheese lovers. <laughs> a drink to go with it, just like chocolate milk, hot milk or something, a fucking hot chocolate and some cheese. The oft forgotten cheese-loving demographic. Thank you. It's great to be finally recognised. Well, there's a few me. members coming in and Dave normally welcomes them in. Uh, Jess lifts mm. up the velvet rope. I read out the name. They run in. Dave gives them a little, sort of like a little zhuzh up, a little bit of a, he's sort of their hype man. You get hyped on your way through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, firstly, from San Antonio in Texas, it's Colin Spenrath. Oh, spend some time in here, Rath. From La Mesa, California, it's Cameron Hidalgo. Hidalgo, we ain't messing around, now you're here, my brother. All right. <laughs> uh, from Padstow in New South Wales, it's Jake Vent. Oh, Went. you've been venting outside, not having a good time, but inside you'll be having the best time. <laughs> from Bedford, Texas, it's Monica Marie Lopez. Oh, they said Jenny from the block. We don't need her. We want Monica Lopez from the block. From Holzkirchen, Holzkirchen, Bavaria. It's Moritz Ramuda. Moritz. Oh, yes, Moritz. Great Saint supporter, Moritz. He's from Holzkirchen. Uh, I'm pretty sure I stayed in Holzkirchen when... I was in uh, Munchen for the Oktoberfest. <laughs> Love it. Putting on Moritz. That's my <laughs> And that's finally, my... from Monterey Park in California, it's Jacob Giron or Giron. <laughs> Did you just say the same name twice? <laughs> one with a hard G, one with a soft. <laughs> well, Jacob Giron or Jacob Giron. <laughs> <laughs> <don't know>. <laughs> <laughs> I possibly did. <laughs> Uh, never going to grin you up. All right, everybody, good night. <laughs> okay, Dave it's was so on late. tonight. He was on. It's so late. It's so late. It's I've got to go to bed. so late here and we've lost our minds. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. We did it. Well done, Matt. Hey, thank you. Thanks Dave, for sticking with it. well done. Fucking be better next week. Why? Oh, you know what you did. You hated on Adelaide, then you hated on cheese. You, you, your heart was full of hate tonight, mate. Oh, Adelaide is a real wine and cheese city too. And that's why I feel a connection to that place. Mm. Ugh, fuck off. <laughs> Much like Adelaide, I'm also a, a big red. No, that's not anything. Adelaide. That's pretty good. That's a big red. Much good. like Adelaide, no one likes me. <laughs> oh, that's a bit rough, Jess. I know a few people who like you. Who? I do. Can I thought you, you were saying that in my voice and I was trying to spin it onto you, but you were just being <laughs> being sad and it, and it is no fun when that's the case. I thought I was being hilarious. You're being very funny. Anyway, Dave, wrap this shit up. All right, thank you so much for joining us for another week of Do Go On. We'll be back next week, but guess what? In between now and then, you can check out our other episodes, our Patreon, our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram by going to dogoonpod.com and uh, clicking on some links or going to at dogoonpod on the aforementioned social medias. It's all there. We also have a YouTube channel. Check out the videos. Our faces move. Mm, big time. It's crazy. Very animated. But apart from that, we'll say thank you so much for joining us and until next time, goodbye. Laters. Bye. Bye. This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. I mean, if you want. It's up to you.